Yes. So supposing you have some associates who you don't think are undesirable, but the Secretary of State does, you're supposed to guess that the Secretary of State thinks that they're undesirable. Um, well, my Lord, that's a different case, isn't it? In this case, what we have is the scenario in the um, calm judgment that's there of a constellation of factors. And procedural fairness is very context-driven. And that's the base on which I put this case. I'm not making a broader point about um, what may be fair or unfair in other cases, because of course there may be instances where um, you know, there needs to be a, a different <coughs> approach, but the question here is, was there a breach of procedural fairness in these cases that was material to the outcome? And there is that constellation of factors that you know, or you must at least be taken to know, that you've made these personal declarations <coughs> that have a significant discrepancy in them. That you know because you filled in the forms that it's a um, cards on the table approach. You know that character, conduct, and associations is a relevant criteria, um, in theory at least, potentially relevant. Um, and there is a, what I say, a reasonable finding that it calls for an explanation. So, in that constellation of factors, um, the issue is there. And as I see, say, in most cases, you'll see it's understood and an explanation is proffered. The quality of the explanation is something different. And the context then for um, the opportunity to provide this and perhaps amplify it. Um, and my answer to that, to the next stage, the providing the explanation, um, is that uh, the process has to be looked at as a whole for procedural fairness um, grounds. My learned friends very fairly conceded that the administrative re review is part of the process. So it isn't the case, and I can understand the concern that you get a 3225 sort of decision made instantly, as it were, and there's no opportunity to address that. That the review is capable of um, leading to a decision not to maintain the decision, as it were, in the light of the well, I, I, uh, explanation. I, I, yes. And I know what's going to be said, well, I anticipate that the, what's been put by my learned friends is that, well, yes, there is this review, but there are limits on the review. No, no, no that wasn't the point I was going to make. I, I, I'm afraid, speaking for myself only, I'm not necessarily prepared to accept that concession, if, if that's what it was. Oh, I see, my Lord. Uh, for, the of, for the purpose of analysis, I certainly need some assistance on what the right conceptual approach is, because it's well established in what used to be called natural justice law, now procedural fairness law, that human nature being what it is, there may well be, even if it's in good faith and a subconscious temptation, to try to be defensive about protecting what a decision which has already been taken. 
I, I so post-decisional fairness, sometimes that's the only way of ensuring fairness. That's what Lord Lustill said in duty. But usually what public law requires is that before a final decision is taken, you have to give someone procedural fairness. Um, I, I see that element there, my lord. Um, I think my response can only be this, really, that um, the review is there to check the correctness of the decision. Yes. Um, it's not litigation in the same way. It's an internal you know, to, to, to see if they've got it wrong, so they don't have to go and defend it in other forums and things of that nature. So it isn't quite the same as having a, a, a sort of adversarial process where you're sticking to your guns. So there is that difference. Um, and it, I think it's important to look at these particular cases and look at their facts. And my learned friend's going to come on to show you that. And I think it will make this clearer. Um, but they, the um, decision makers do look at the explanations. It's right they might not look at supporting evidence. So, But if the explanation is, I relied on my accountant, that explanation will be considered. And you'll see in the um, administrative review letters it's, it's taken into account. Um, I do accept, I fully see, that um, there might be an extra dimension um, to that consideration if, you know, if there's sort of material that gives the ins and outs of how the accountant made the mistake or, or something of that nature. But prima facie, the explanation, and whether it's a reasonable explanation or not depends a bit on the case law, but prima facie, it's going to be before the decision maker. This is my explanation, this is my, and the decision maker must deal with it. In the administrative re review decision, they've got to make a decision, now, is this going to go back? Like some of them do go back. It's not, as I say, like a litigation process. And you know, some of them will go back and you no, know, we're not confident the case workers really got this one right. So um, it, 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 it is capable of providing a new decision, as it were, and the decision might be not to provide, not to apply paragraph 3225. But on the so, same evidence? Um, on the same evidence, my exactly. lord. And so I have to that, that, well, that, yes, well, isn't, but isn't that fatal? Well, if the whole point is the reason why you're having to put up administrative review as the answer if we have concerns <coughs> about uh, procedural fairness, the point is the person hasn't known in advance that uh, the discrepancy was going to be said to be dishonest uh, and may have an explanation which hasn't, they haven't by definition advanced up to that point. Uh, uh, and in respect to which they will want to have evidence, say the accountant saying, this is exactly what happened, here are my contemporary documents showing that I made this silly error, or perhaps that my client made this silly error but I didn't pick it up. Whatever the explanation is, um, uh, that won't be admitted. So it doesn't cure the problem. Well, it does depend. I mean, and as I say, it might be better to look at the context of these cases to see how much difference this makes because you do look at procedural fairness overall and you look at whether it, it made a difference. But in most of these cases, if the, if the explanation is I'm live on my accountant, you can take that explanation and consider it for the purposes of, of um, the, the assessment because it's, although I know we're using the term dishonesty, at the end of the day, it is what's relevant to character conduct and, and association. So um, if you know the Secretary of State has got that in mind in the sense of being a requirement in order to grant this application, um, and you know there's a discrepancy, so you know different things are happening because these are personal declarations, and generally it's regarded as reasonable that an, you know, reasonable inference of um, prima facie anyway of, of dishonesty could be an explanation for that, whether it is the explanation or something different, it could be an explanation, so it's in there in the four. Then in my submission, in those um, scenarios, if you are considering the explanation, um, then unless it really is the case that having the accountant say, this is particularly how it happened, um, is going to make such a significant difference as well, to but change But isn't, isn't that then simply an assertion? Because you can't rely on any evidence. So um, the Secretary of State says, it, this is dishonest, and you say whatever you want to say. Um, it's all the accountant's fault. Well, <coughs> so what? There's no evidence to support that. Yeah, my Lord, I don't shy away from that. I'm not saying that the fact that the evidence um, isn't there doesn't mean there's not a... Um, there's less there. But normally, a decision maker would act on evidence, not on anything else. Um, yes, my lord. I mean, obviously, there's also the quality of the evidence and whether it is going to make a difference. But in principle, I've got to accept that even though you're not, although well, in fact, here yeah, there's no evidence. Yeah. In fact, in practice, you usually do consider what's put in. But again, I've got to stick with what the, the rules are, you do, and, and yeah. the rules are yeah. 
that um, you can't do the full shebang. You know, the, the, but it is still um, not cases of silly mistakes. Um, it really is, you know, that they shouldn't be coming into the court unless, you know, it shouldn't be there in the first place unless there's reliable evidence that creates a situation where, you know, there's a question to be answered, there's an explanation to be called for. So, um, because if it is just transposition of figures or, you know, something of that nature, then that should be called to the first. Um, and that's what you can say. I mean, you really can say no explanation without evidence. Well, to be honest, you know, look at this, it's a, you know, 1% difference and it's, you know, really not relevant to anything um, in the review. And then that's, it would be irrational for the Secretary of State to <coughs> maintain a decision, you know, where it's really... So, um, in my submission, when you look at these cases in the round overall, which is what you must do with procedural fairness, and I appreciate that improvements could be made, and they are being made to the process, and you'll see in terms of um, <coughs> perhaps... Um, the difficulty in asking very directed questions is that that's said to be too closed and people are then constrained in the response they can give. Of course, if you ask a question, then people might not understand what you're getting at. So there's always that dilemma, always that trade-off in terms. But this really is an administration of the um, uh, immigration system which can't be done. Was that, Ms Anderson, can I ask you this? I think both sides have suggested that there may be some analogy to be drawn with the naturalisation context under Section 6 of the British Nationality Act. Now, uh, what happened in the Fayed case in 1997 was that in this court, at least the majority held, and there was no appeal from it, the majority held that uh, what the Secretary of State had to do was, uh, before reaching a final decision, put squarely to the person concerned. If there were concerns about the applicant's character. Even though everyone knows that one of the requirements of British citizenship on application is good character. So, so there the analogy is similar to your situation. But despite all of that being known, uh, what the court held was that before you reach a final decision, if you have a concern about someone's character, you have to put that squarely to them. And my understanding, but correct me if this is wrong, is that ever since then, what the Home Office have done in naturalisation cases is to adopt a minded to refuse procedure. Uh, now, assume that premise is correct uh, for the moment, but what would be wrong with having a minded to refuse procedure in this context? Well, my Lord, I think that um, it depends at what level, legally or practically, I don't know if I'm well, allowed to respond practically, but yeah, okay. practically speaking, this is the points-based system, which is I meant see. to be um, not big exercises of discretion. Or um, I'm not saying that there aren't circumstances in which that's necessary, but it, I think the idea was to make it simpler for people, actually, and quicker for people that they... they so there's that context. I'm not saying it rules out the, the minded to refuse. Right. That um, the... <coughs> Uh, so, in terms of procedure, it's not intended to be elaborate, but may need to be in certain circumstances. You may need to deviate from what you would normally have because there's particular issues, I accept that. That, in terms of um, how it's done, um, I think it's as my Lord put it to me earlier, if, if your original decision is almost set in stone, as it were, and, in, and really the review process isn't a review process properly of all of the factors taking account of everything, but is just a justification process for what's already happened, then I don't think you could see the original <coughs> decision more in line with minded to refuse. But if genuinely it's, well, we've got all this information, this is the inference to be drawn from this, this is it seems to be, you know, and, and usually there is an explanation, but, you know, so there'll be a view on that. But if, um, if there's none at all, well, there's going to be a noting, well, there's no explanation, and that's going to be... As long as at that next stage... Um, that can be looked at in the light of an explanation. You may not have the evidence, and I fully accept that, but um, if, so if it is a bit like um, minded to refuse in that sense, in that it genuinely isn't set in stone until you get past the administrative review level, um, then, uh, you know, that, that I think is all I can say for how this process could be fitted into that analysis. Do, do I understand from that that there, are no there would be no practical, practical difficulties uh, in adopting that process uh, 
in this context? I simply don't have extractions on it, so I, I really can't talk to practical difficulties. I can only say what's already sort of in the case law, which is this was the intention of the points-based system. It was meant to work in this way. But, but in, in terms of that, uh, I know we, we, we have seen a lot of these cases, the, the, the cases illustrated by these four uh, appeals. But, uh, the, the number of cases in which um, uh, there is this disparity in, in, in all of the immigration applications uh, must be very small. I mean, well, we're not talking about this happening in every, in every case. It, it, this is not going to upset the entire points-based system as a system. Um, do you mean by that, my lord, the paragraph 3225 refusals are a small percentage? Or do you mean no, the, no, the, the, the tier 5, uh, the, the tier the, the, 1? The, the cases that we're dealing with, which is where there is, is a, a, a discrepancy, discrepancy, an identified discrepancy mm, between yeah. declarations and I think my lord might be looking up the um, review, which I think has got some statistics in that, that um, it does kind of give a, um, an indication. Um, and certainly, uh, it may be, and you can see there's already been a, a review of partial, you know, on a different level, of, of the caseload. So, I mean, I can't say that it would be um, um, disproportionately huge. I'm not, um, it's not like the Article 8 point, which is of much different character. Um, I think it might be just more of a general point about whether you're always required to have a minded to review, refuse for paragraph 3225, because that might be right across the board. Where, where the uh, Secretary of State um, is suspect of dishonesty, mm -hmm. those are the yeah. cases we're considering, not every 3225. No, no. um, yeah. well, yes, although my Lord did put to me another example <coughs> of where it might be. So, um, as ever, I'm always anxious about saying general things, which then lead to tranches of caseloads coming through that kind of for the record, according to the review, in the three and a half year period, or maybe it would be three year period that the review looked at, um, there uh, were uh, 1,697 uh, tier one general migrants cases refused under 3225. It's not, I think, broken down into uh, those which are uh, because of discrepancies in the accounts, but I think the inference is, and one would expect, that the rate great majority of them were of that character. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, and yeah, I think there is some breakdown actually um, Maybe I was a bit, bit earlier about you know what the reasons were. But I mean, there are two questions, aren't there? There's firstly, what do you do about the ones that have already happened? And that's a question of looking at procedural fairness overall in the round, in the individual cases, and whether the upper tribunal decisions are sustainable in that context. And then there's the going forward, um, what would be the, the best way to deal with this? And um, in the light of what's, what's been um, considered and, and um, in these in these cases and perhaps in the more general context um, where it comes up and it may be there's a model in the naturalization process that actually ought to be rolled out across um, a wider um, area um, but as I say fortunately I think although of course it, guidance would be um, helpful and, and of course the decision on, on their lawfulness will be obvious but um, obviously required um, but actually it, the, the primary focus must be in these individual appeals on, on whether the tribunal was right. Well, that's um, something that my lords may want to ask further. Uh, we probably said all you yeah, want to say about procedural fairness. Yeah, I was about to just move on to Article 8, and that would be it. The, well, the now, can I just flag up? There are two aspects to Article 8. There's one which you half developed, um, but then you said you would come back to it. But I think we know most of what your case is about whether Article 8 is engaged by a decision of this kind at all. Anything more you want to say on that, we'll obviously hear. Uh, but there is a, a, a technical area which um, we will certainly want any assistance you can give on about uh, whether, if we are persuaded that Article 8 is engaged by these decisions, but if it is also our view, uh, that uh, the better way of dealing with any Article 8 issues is by a uh, human rights decision, which can then be the subject of a human rights appeal. Uh, any uh, submissions the Secretary of State has about a, a sensible procedure whereby that can be set up in the future. There's obviously a parallel, it may not be an exact parallel, with the issues we had to look at in RSAM. So. Um, if you can deal with the latter point as well as the former. So, um, well, just starting with the, um, the, the first point, really about whether it has to be within this application, the Article 8. Um, and the reason it's said to have to be within this application 
is because the consequences are refusal of refusal, or you won't have any means, and therefore you'll be placed in the hospital. What, what is called the hostile environment, although I don't think that's the terminology that's generally uncontroversial. So if um, that's considered first of all, that if the real problem is either the application of paragraph 3225 and ongoing effects, or the effects of having no relief, then it is my submission, and I, I said it earlier, can I only say it in one sentence to flag it up, that the better way to deal with that is not by granting INR to somebody where you've already at stage three of limb one found their presence to be undesirable in order to accommodate factors that might be relevant to Article 8 rights. So my primary submission is that the residual discretion under that rule is under that rule. And that's what it's Well, that point you certainly have made so, already, yes. So coming on from that, assuming I've, I've um, uh, lost on that and that there's a, it has to come in in some way, um, my answer really is that the, the best way by far is to make, you're not left without a basis for obtaining leave within the UK by this INR decision. You can make a human rights application to remain in the UK and raise your leave. Yeah, but then let, let's, just, let's just follow how that would work procedurally. Okay. Assume, and I agree this is contrary to some of the submissions you've made, but assume for the moment you haven't seen this point coming and you shouldn't reasonably have seen this point coming. Uh, but, uh, so there has been nothing in your application raising a human rights point. You've just made a standard points-based system IOR application, which doesn't have any box for human rights aspects and you're not expected to deal with human rights aspects. So you don't realise there's a human rights issue uh, until the adverse decision is made and assume, which will typically be the case, so I'm sure you'd say not always, that that refusal uh, indirectly, if not directly, will impact on your human rights because it renders you liable to removal, having been here many years and developed a private life, perhaps for other reasons as well, to do with reputation and hostile environment and so forth. So you are then in a human rights um, problem. Is, your, is it your case that the correct thing to do is when you've got this decision, and assume it's, uh, you don't wish to challenge it or by way of judicial review for some extraneous reason, the only problem is a human rights reason, is you should then complain of that decision uh, as a, uh, a human rights claim and then get a decision on that, which will take however long it takes, and then appeal against that. Um, is, is, is that your, what you're saying? My Lord, I think it does depend whether you're at um, stage three of limb one, you know, are you complaining about um, the public interest being wrongly in that analyse? So we're saying it's not that, so what we're taking as read is that yes, your presence will be undesirable in principle, but you're complaining about... No, it. no, 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 sorry, you, you are complaining. Uh, one of the things you're complaining about, because this is the only justification for the interference with your, with your, with your, with your, is the fact that you were wrongly held to have um, uh, deceived the revenue. Uh, that, so that's what the human rights claim will in practice be about. There might be some extra reasons, but um, if you haven't done that, then you are very unlikely to have a, a separate uh, Article 8. Uh, claim because generally, if the immigration rule has been fairly applied to you, then uh, your removal will be justified. Ah, I thought there was a wider issue, which may not be, which is that um, the discretion issue. But notwithstanding, no, I'm not on that. Yeah. I, I'm yeah. on. I, so, I'm. I'm I am on, on the, the question where with. the only issue, but raised because of its Article Eight consequences, is the decision that you. Uh, uh, lied to the revenue and therefore your leave to remain uh, has been re well, removed or it's gone. So if what you're challenging is that paragraph 3225 um, decision in itself, how it was made or something of that nature, then plainly judicial review is the right way to do it. Well um, I'm wondering about that. You see the whole point is that uh, if the real issue is uh, simply whether you did or didn't deceive the revenue, the view which we certainly took for about the equivalent issue of whether you cheated in the um, uh, language test in, in the RSAT case was that judicial review was not the best way of dealing with it. 
it was an available vehicle because it's always there as a vehicle of last resort, but that it was better. And this was the line the Secretary of State herself urged on us. <coughs> um, we don't want all these things done by judicial review. There's a suitable alternative remedy, uh, namely uh, a hearing the first tier tribunal uh, framed as a human rights claim. And that's the better way of deciding this. And we agreed with that because it's, uh, has, it's, it's the right tribunal, the, the normal fact-finding tribunal, namely the FTT. Uh, and uh, it doesn't take up the resources of the upper tribunal, which are very limited. Uh, there are more judges in the first tier tribunal. And this is what they're doing day in, day out. So that's what I'm putting to you. Okay. Well, well, there's two elements of that, because it has been raised. Firstly is the Secretary of State's position in that case. Um, I think I have to say that it's clearly put to the court that there was a problem with those cases. They were taking up a lot of resources in terms of, um, I mean, there really was a lot of those, and it was recognised that it was posing a real problem for the courts in dealing with them because it was such a large chance of cases. And that was really the context in which there was a resolution put forward by the Secretary of State taking all that into account. And you'll see that in, in the, um, the uh, respondent's skeleton argument, there's some indications. And in fact, in the, in the judgment, I think it's, it's the, the position of Secretary of State there is set out. And that was the resolution for those cases. So there's that question. And then there's the question, does that mean that either of them are stoppable or that the same will necessarily be true of other instances, um, <coughs> which might be said to be... Well, no, come on. Let, so, let's, let's, sorry. So yeah, are you saying... But then let's not beat about the bush and say it, that your position is different from what it was in Arsan. Right. Because in Arsan there was a concession. In paragraph 14 of Arsan there was a concession by Ms. Giovanetti. You, you, you don't make that concession in this case. Because it is um, very different. And as my lords have already indicated, the scale of this is just not the same. And certainly the litigation scale of this is not the same. So it doesn't have those particular. <coughs> Up the system. Right. Well, we may have to come back, but I'm not sure we will, to so, why you have changed your, your position. I very much doubt that there's any estoppel as such. Um, uh, my more important point is to understand what your... What the what, suppose this was a clean slate. Uh, why the route that we, in fact, took in Arsan, or recommended in Arsan, uh, isn't the best route here, too? Well, there's um, principle and practice. And in principle, we have to be very careful not to create an appeal right where Parliament has taken it away in respect of decisions that don't have an appeal right. No, so but I the appeal right would be unquestionably, it, it, it would have, the, the claimant would always have to show that there had been an interference with their human rights, their Article 8 rights. Set that entirely, but their Parliament has given them. So there's no question of taking away, of, of giving a right which a parliament has taken away. So how does that right arise? And my simple submission is this, that it's not actually the INR decision in itself, and I made the submission already, yes. that is a decision to interfere with your Article 8 rights. Yes. It's a refusal of INR under the points-based system that's meant to be straightforward and sensible and, and you know, dealt with in a, in a particular way. If there are human rights implications of that decision, um, then you make an application to the Secretary of State, and I'll give you the reference, but I'll show you one of those Section 120 notices. Um, you raise it with the Secretary of State, whether you raise it by way of proper application with all your forms filled in, or whether you raise it in response to a Section 120 notice that says, are there reasons why we ought to have these in the UK? And that is the way to deal with it. And then um, the proper procedure will be followed through, focused on those Article 8 questions. It won't be focused, and, and within that, you can challenge the paragraph 225 <coughs> decision if that is the reason um, for removal or um, not. Uh, yeah. You know, then, then for for the, the interference, however, it's interference, characterized. Yeah. Then that can be challenged sort of on its merits in the Article 8 appeal. If you can see that, you can see. Yes. That no, that's very clear, and this is conceptually very clear, but um, we'll have to decide whether we agree with it. Mm -hmm. But so your position is that. Uh, if the decision um, does indeed engage human rights, uh, interfere with human rights, uh, then you, once you've got the decision, uh, you uh, raise a fresh claim in the language of the statute, you get a decision about that, and uh, you then appeal against that. 
quite understand. Now, uh, Manuel, can I, what, can I, can I correct you? It might not be a fresh claim just because you might not have already made an RCA claim, but it doesn't matter. That's mm. just a tweak. Right. Well, now, uh, I really wanted to explore two, th two, two things uh, arising out of that. One is it said that uh, that uh, is in practice likely to take a very long time uh, because it takes a long time to get a human rights decision once you've raised a claim and that it is more efficient if it is possible to um, uh, uh, raise it at an earlier stage. Well, let's just deal with the question of the length of time. Well, length of time. Um, it would go from Miss Point Bay case, Point Space caseworker anyway across to, uh, um, unless you're going to say you do without having the proper form filled in and all the information, there's always got to be another stage. You've always got to give the information. And then the question arises, who considers that information? It would normally go to another dedicated RCA caseworker anyway. Um, whether it's um, whether there's any time to be saved by not having the proper forms filled in and not putting it in in a normal way, um, I'm not sure. About well, that. can I then really? That leads me on to my second question, which is: just suppose um, uh, that we went down the route of saying that there ought in these cases to be a minded to matter. Um, uh, it would be possible for that minded to letter to say, I'm minded to find that you lied to the revenue. And one consequence of that, if I do, is that I will refuse your decision under section 322, uh, under rule 3225. Uh, uh, please give me your response to the allegation that you have acted dishonestly. Uh, please also some sort of one-stop, or second, this is effectively a, a pre-Section 120, please also let me know whether there are any uh, uh, human rights consequences if my decision is adverse that you wish uh, me to take into account. So you would then have a human rights claim made in the form of the response. The Secretary of State's decision would deal with it under both heads, and there would then be a right of uh, to appeal at that stage once the final decision had been made. Wouldn't that be more efficient and uh, economical? Well, I can see the logic of it, my lord. Of course, it's not what's happened here. So we are no, but I think we may be wanting to say, I take yeah. the point that we've only got to decide the issues in front of us, but that may in practice involve a degree of saying what a good procedure would have been. Yes, um, and with all I've appropriate got, caution. Yeah, I've, I've got no quarrel for um, guidance. In fact, it's very welcome as to you know what might be done. Um, I'm obviously acting for my client and, and knowing yep. how many cases there are. I've got to make it clear that this is no concession of unlawfulness or that what's been done no, no, of course. is in any way wrong. Uh, what we're talking about here is you know in an ideal world, if we're designing the system, how would we design it? Um, and um, in my submission, it's not really clear to me that that is actually really any more. Um, than or effective than um, <coughs> doing what actually happened here, which is you send the letter which deals with the ILR, um, high, you know, highly skilled migrant ILR application, you send that letter, and then you send the 120 notice, which I'll just show you one more, that then raises it. So you're not kind of eliding the two decisions together. Um, you're very clearly doing your articulated analysis. But it is good to elide the two decisions together, isn't it? Because they, are, they both depend on essentially the same factual question. In a pure case, forget there might be other issues, but in a pure case, where the Secretary of State is refusing purely because he believes that the applicant lied at a previous stage of the process. Why, why have that looked at twice? Well, my Lord, it's really two things happening here then, isn't there? Because if, it, if that is the only thing in question, if there aren't any other Article 8 matters that the claimant would want to put forward, or the applicant would want to put forward, then you can see that. But really what's been suggested is a minor to refuse letter so that people can provide you with further information, provide you with Article 8 relevant considerations. So it, it isn't quite the same, is it? You either, and instinct tells me that it's better to have the Article 8 um, considerations separately with, with a sort of design process. So the caseworker isn't trying to balance a public law decision under the rules and the discretion under the rules, which as we in the submissions earlier discussed, you might have relevant factors, but you're looking at them differently. You're not looking at them in the article heading, as it were, they're coming in in public law kind of considerations. 
I think there is a danger if you've got the two going on at once that um, it, you might not find the right product or approach to the Well, I mean, this happens the whole time in, in um, another context, uh, deep, deep, deportation. Yeah. Or uh, you, first of all, in the same decision, you look at the rules, which are meant to cover <coughs> Article 8 in the zero <coughs> cases, and then the decision maker in the same letter says, and I've looked also at Article 8 outside the rules. So um, it wouldn't be any different from that, would it? The difference there, I think, my lord, is that in deportation, typically, regularly, it's normally under the automatic deportation regime, so there's no discretion for the Secretary of State. What you're looking at there is essentially the same question in a sense, because you're looking at would there be a breach of international obligations, either either Convention on Refugee or Human Rights Convention, by deportation. It's a step or two side consideration, mostly. And then um, you then you might consider sort of um, matters that aren't um, article eight proper. I mean, but as I say, it's um, you can see that it's very much the same territory there because deportation is about removal as well. Whereas okay. this isn't about removing somebody. This is about not granting somebody leave. And I think that is a key difference. If, if, if you um, say that Article 8, the Article 8 claim should be dealt with uh, in, as an entirely separate immigration claim, uh, for example, um, in response to a separate monetary notice, because you have to make a claim in respect to that notice. Uh, um, uh, that's the only way that you can get an, another ground uh, on board. Um, <coughs> then you would, then in, in in challenge to the Section 3225 3, 3, 3, 3, decision, you'd have a judicial review. Mm -hmm. uh, and, the ju uh, and the only point of the judicial review was um, uh, whether the um, dishonesty uh, found by the uh, Secretary of State uh, was a, 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 a good finding. That would be the only issue. Yeah, well, that's what my Lord puts me in terms of a pure challenge. If yes. the pure challenge is just... But in these, case, in these cases, that's the issue. That would be the issue. Well, Whereas in the, in the um, Article 8 claim, uh, you would have to make the same factual finding, uh, but in an appeal setting. So you'd have parallel decision, you'd have parallel proceedings um, based upon the same um, determinative fact. Uh, but that fact would be assessed in, in, in different ways. Well, of course, you couldn't have the parallel, my lord, because um, judicial review is the remedy of last resort. So if you can go on appeal to have that issue determined, you must do that first. So I don't think we've got the parallel um, problem. I think the, the issue is essentially this, that if what you're targeting is whether or not the decision about um, 3225 is well made, is rational, sustainable, well made, um, then judicial review is apt for that because that's what it's all about. If what you're really saying is, well, there's that, but you've got to take into account this, this, and this, and this because Article 8 says you have, or because there's you know, some, and um, it's not all about whether it's correct in strict terms, the decision, but whether it's sort of um, sustainable in wider terms, you know, because of the effect of not having any leave, then that in my submission, ought to go under an Article 8 analysis. Or a, um, and within that, it doesn't have to be just Article 8. You could also have a reasonableness of maintaining a decision. You know. So, um, if, if, if those submissions are right, um, the route you propose, which is to have a full Article 8 claim, immigration claim, and then appeal, uh, it, it is, is far more complicated and time-consuming than simply having an appeal right as against um, the finding in the 3225 because uh, the uh, finding in 3225 is, is just a, pu a pure question of fact. None of these other uh, Article 8 factors matter. It simply was the dishonesty or not. It's that simple. And that will, that will determine that issue. It will also, uh, um, I suspect, determine it for the purposes of any Article 8 claim later. I, mean, but, uh, uh, I, I think, my Lord, it, it, my reservation about... Um, putting it all together under this heading is that this is about an ILR application. If you succeed in your challenge or what have you, you get settlement. But if, if, if you if were, I'm sorry, in these cases, if the individuals weren't dishonest, that's it. No, there's no other ground for refusal. Mm. Well, but a lot of submissions have been made about the consequences of um, 
the refusal, the wider consequence of the refusal, and that's why. If, if that Article 8 examination, whoever does it, is just solely contained to, is it right or wrong, that factual scenario you're putting, did this happen or didn't it happen, or is it, then um, I can see the point, my Lord, but it's not... An, an well, that will nearly it. always be the case. You can, you can imagine special cases where there are other Article 8 considerations that are kind we're familiar with in deportation cases, you know, extreme hardship and so on. But uh, uh, the typical case will be of this character, that someone who had a right otherwise to ILR under the rules is having it refused only because they are found to have lied, uh, and that refusal uh, engages in their art with their article eight rights, as it nearly always will, but given these people will have been here a long time, not absolutely necessarily, but again in the great majority of cases. Well, my lord, if if all of it is you've got it wrong, Secretary of State, as it were, in your um, then in my submission, judicial review is the way to target that because that's what that decision was about. Um, if it is, I've been here a long time, and it's really unfair. Um, to you know, um, have this consequence for me now after I've been here a long time, and I want you to take all these factors into account. Well, well, you wouldn't take all those factors into no. You, you, there would clearly have to be a threshold. But that's why I referred to having been there a long time for Article Eight rights to be engaged at all. Once that switch is on, the only issue will be whether they lied or not. Because if they did lie, then there's a cast down justification for interference with their Article 8 rights. And if they didn't lie, there is no justification. Um, I, see, I see the second bit, there's no justification. I'm not sure my learned friends would accept the first bit, my Lord. As, as an article eight well, oh, but they could argue that case in a... They could nine. argue that, all right, they could argue that case, but they would probably have difficulty. But I, well, my Lord, I don't, I'm not sure about that, because I think that, um, just to be fair, I mean, I'm probably arguing against myself here a little bit, but you oh. can see the article 8 analysis is, is um, structurally different. It is, I mean, it might be there's no justification because none of this happened, right? Or it might be um, there's no justification because the consequences of, you know, because you've got someone in the hospital or you've well, got, um, you know, are too severe. <coughs> so I think, I think that's what I'm concerned about. I think there's two, there's probably three different things going on here. There's the, um, did the things happen and the rationality of, of the inference of dishonesty or, or relevance to character and conduct there's the discretion, the residual discretion to depart from the policy about applying 3325 to those cases where there is such conduct. And then there's that third question of if there are other reasons, article 8 reasons, matters of rights, that have to be taken into account as to whether or not this person should be given leave in the UK on a different basis, on an article 8 basis, then um, that should be done. Well, uh, I think we've heard your Can I just ask one other question arising out of this article 8 point? A point is made in the skeleton argument uh, that uh, uh, the human rights claim ought to be made um, by on the correct form and paying the correct fee. Uh, Ms. Giovanetti in uh, Arsan conceded that although the Secretary of State wanted for reasons of good order, uh, matters uh, to be dealt with in that way. It was not a legal requirement, and in fact, the Section 120 notice is an example of how you can raise, make an Article 8 claim without filling in an article, whatever the correct Home Office form is, and paying the fee. Uh, I just wanted to be clear that there were no actual regulatory requirements that you have to make a human rights claim in some circumstances and subject to some exceptions by filling in a particular form and paying a particular fee. I don't know where all of that comes from. We've not been referred to anything. Well, I was going to say, my Lord, just in the shortest of time, nothing's changed from what was put before you by um, Ms. Giovanetti in terms of structure and... Um, I think it would be helpful, um, nevertheless, um, not don't deal with it now, as you say, because of time. Could we have a note immediately after the hearing simply setting out whatever the formal basis is for the normal practice of requiring a fee and the use of a particular form. It's probably in the rule somewhere, but I, I don't know yeah, where. I, mean, I, I, I think it, this was the point dealt with in Tress, but the case of Tress, or one of them was put into the bundle. Uh, it was this very case, whether 
um, when the Secretary of State sent a Section 120 notice, whether representations in response to that notice were good enough, uh, or whether the usual um, requirement for a particular form for a human rights claim and a particular fee um, uh, have to be complied with. Um, yes, absolutely, my Lord. So, so the, the I'll, I'll put that in the notes, shall I just so I'll make sure that's included so um, the court's got fully. I'm only mindful of the time, but yeah. yes, I yes, certainly no agree with that. that that's the, um, so um, I think that's almost it for me then, my Lord. I've, I've, Lord, I've referenced Tameside, um, but Tameside and HMRC are really hand in hand points. Yep. Um, I've made written submissions on those. Just on the HMRC point, I think I've approached very clear that um, the headline really is that it's a different um, assessment, that HMRC, HMRC make their assessment on the information they've got for their particular purposes. It can't possibly be substituted or, in my submission, really be even relevant to the full assessment by the Secretary of State taking account of all the information and knowing those immigration context factors that might cast a different um, different approach on, you know, the HMRC might take it at face value, they've got no reason not to, but it may be put in this context and knowing what we know about these cases that that might be um, uh, you know, a, a, an uninformed assessment. So, um, my Lord, I think unless, I'm just going to give you that Schedule 120 um, reference. Um, not no. all of <coughs> them. I was just going to give well, you one will be enough, yes. um, page 1648. And you'll see that in all of them they do follow on. I think my letter might give them all to you, but I just wanted to show you that there is one, one six four eight, that follows on from the decision. So from the Secretary of State's point of view, it's not regarded as the end of the matter. Oh, um So what we've been calling the section one hundred and twenty notice is not the whole docu the whole page of 1647, which is an enforcement notice which tells you you're liable for removal, spells out the hostile environment points. It's simply the paragraph at the bottom of the page starting, if you have further reasons for wishing to stay, and says um, you must state them and refer to section 120. Um, um, my Lord, I know that, that, that's, the, that's the section 120 notice. Yeah, thank you. Um, my Lord, I know it's seen as aggressive to put all the stuff about removal at the top, but really it's informative as well. No, I, I wasn't drawing any conclusion yeah. about it. No, it's informative. Um, so, unless I can assist further, my learned friend... Yes, just, just, just one moment. Um, Mr. Malik, you've been um, sitting in the pavilion for a long time, um, but you're going to have to stay a little bit longer because I think this is the sensible point at which to find out yes. what bid Ms. Nike is going to make for, to address us on any particular uh, points because I know you're going to deal with Tameside, but apart from that you're going to deal with the individual cases, whereas Ms. Nike, by definition, is dealing with generalities. Yes. So um, uh, can I ask you to um, hold your piece for a moment. Yes, uh, Lord, I'm of course content with that, but it's just that I, I, I may be able to assist you in relation to some of the questions, some of the other questions that uh, you raised this morning. With oh, well, very well, um, Mr. Malik, I trust you. Um, uh, this, so you're going to deal with points that are relevant to what we've already heard, rather yes. than, yes. Yes, yes. Well, let's hear what they are. Yes. I may. If, 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 if you then wish, I, I can then uh, move to uh, the particular cases. That well, we'll certainly hear Ms. Knight before that, yes. Lords, you'll recall that at the outset there was some discussion uh, about the burden and standard of proof. And, and my learned friend, Ms. Henderson, sought to persuade you to use, to, to avoid those, yes. that sort of language. <coughs> uh, and that uh, is a point that troubled this court uh, in the case of Giri. Uh, may, yes. may I show you two paragraphs in that judgment? Well, I, I, uh, I'm broadly familiar with I think it will be enough unless you want to. Just yes. to tell us what the paragraphs are, because they, it does ring a bell and time is short. Yes. Uh, firstly, paragraph 32, uh, where Lord Mr. Richards said that the ultimate question uh, is whether it was reasonably open to the decision maker uh, 
uh, to find on the material before him that deception was used. So it may be uh, that in these cases, rather than using the language of burden or standard of proof, the court would prefer to use the same sort of language that Lord Justice made in that particular paragraph. The fair point, right. Uh, and, and, and secondly, paragraph 38, where Lord Justice Richard said uh, that expressions uh, such as heightened scrutiny should be avoided. That's a slightly different point. But yes. <coughs> Right, thank you. That's, that's a useful reference. Yes. Uh, uh, mo moving on, uh, Lord, uh, a question uh, was asked uh, that the refusal of ILA in these cases meant that a person becomes an overstayer. Yes. And he becomes subject to the hostile environment provisions. Yes. Uh, and that is the context in which uh, one has to look at these cases. Yes. Uh, and that was the premise on which uh, Miller and Friends for the appellants uh, pursued uh, their cases, both in relation to fairness and, and Article 8. Yes. Uh, in my respectful submission, uh, it is not true that a refusal of ILA means that a person becomes an overstayer in every case. And it is certainly not true in the three cases that are before the court. Uh, the first point, uh, my lords, is that uh, one has to have regard to Section 3C of the Immigration Act 1971. That provision says that if a person makes an in-time application for leave to remain to the Secretary of State, the leave automatically extends while that application is pending. Yeah. And if that application is refused, the leave would remain extent until uh, the time to make an administrative review application yes. expires. And if an administrative review application is made, then the leave will remain extent until the administrative review decision is taken. I take that point, and to be fair to him, Mr. Biggs made that point. I don't think he meant that at the very moment of the Section 3205 decision, yes. um, uh, leave to remain came to an end. Uh, but... Uh, it was an inevitable consequence that it would yes. come to an end within whatever period it was necessary to deal with the administrative review. Yes. And isn't, isn't that enough for his point? Or does that undermine his yeah, whole the, the, the point? The point, my lord, is that uh, uh, it, it's not that a person becomes an overstayer automatically once an ILR, ILR application is refused. And when I will show you the decisions taken in these cases, I'll seek to show my lords that even after the ILR application refusal, it is open to the applicant uh, uh, to, to, to make, make other applications. Well, of uh, course, and, I understand that. Uh, is that your second point? Or is it uh, coming to your second point? No, this, is, this, is, this is the first one. The, well, the first second point. point is this, that well, let's, let's look at the facts of, of these cases. SM, the refusal of his ILR application did not make him an overstayer. He made his ILR application well before yes. his leave was... Well, again, I think Mr. Biggs it. accepted that. There would be reasons where, where, for reasons peculiar to individual cases, yes. their original discretionary leave had not yet expired. Yes. And that, that's true as well. And in, perhaps in those cases, it might be yes. uh, that you, Article 8 didn't kick in. Yes. But in the typical case... Yes. Uh, by the time that the ILR application decision is made, any previous discretionary leave will have expired. And I think that's really Mr. Biggs' point. Yeah, but I'm, I'm sorry, and just to be clear, that is the case in Mr. Balaji-Gan. Yes, it's the case, I think, in all the cases except no, Majumdar. No, 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 no. The, the, reality, the reality is that that is not the case in three out of four cases that are before the court. Uh, firstly, you, you have Majumdar who had extent leave to remain. The same is the position uh, in relation to the appellant. Uh, Cowers, his uh, indefinite leave to remain application was refused uh, before his original leave came to an end. Yes. He did not become an overstayer as a consequence of uh, the I ILR refusal decision. No, well, I, so, I, far as, so far as, as Albert is concerned, he was already an overstayer when he made his ILR application. So it's not that the Secretary of State's decision uh, made him an overstayer 
and by that decision he became the subject of hostile environment provisions. I, I, take, I, I, I take your point, uh, and I'm subject to any we may hear, let's assume that it's only Balajigari yes. where, where there's... Uh, on a common sense view, on a larger sample, Balajigari would be the more typical, wouldn't it? There happen in these other cases to be peculiar reasons, either why they were already overstayers or why their discretionary leave hadn't, extend, hadn't expired. But typically, people make their applications at the very end of their discretionary leave, and it takes some time for them to be decided, and they're on 3C leave by the time the um, decision is made. Isn't that the typical case? Uh, well, taking the example of, of, of the four cases that are before the court, that, that, isn't, that, that isn't, in my respect, All right. a, 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 a typical case. I'm sorry, but, but uh, you, my understanding of your submission was not that it's, as it were, a, a, a numbers game. Uh, but the, um, the the reason that they become overstayers is the coming to an end uh, of the discretionary leave to remain. Now that coming to an end is extended by Section 3C because of their further application. Uh, but the determination of the application, as I understand your submission, uh, it do doesn't bring anything to an end. It just fails. Is that? That well, that, 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 that is true, perhaps, in, in Balajigari case. But in, in, in Majumdar's case, uh, the decision to refuse indefinite leave to remain application was made well before the original leave came. I, I, think, I think my lord is making a point in your favour. Yes, I am. Or at any rate, trying to understand the, yes, the, force, the force of your point is, well, the fact that it, sometimes th these cases, whether they're many or few, yes. are illustrative of your point that at the conceptual level, the refusal of the ILR is not itself what makes you an overstayer. It is the fact that whatever leave you had before has gone. Yes. If it has. Yes. 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 So, so, so. Well, it's a, it's, yeah. a point, it's a point well made, and, and it is clearly the right conceptual answer, but Article 8, it might be said Article 8 takes a rather broader view, which and Mr. Biggs was really asking us to take a broader view when talking about functionally. Yes. This is the result of the decision. Uh, you, uh, as, as I understand, the, 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 the argument is that the refusal of indefinite leave to remain application in effect, in effect is a removal decision. And that is the decision that requires or expects a person to leave the United yes. Kingdom. The point that I'm, I'm seeking to make is that that point may be a good point in other cases, but not, not in three cases that, that I'm, I'm instructed in. And therefore, the hostile environment provisions, at least in, in the three cases that I'm instructed in, uh, do, do not do not do not rise. Yeah. Uh, 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 Sorry to interrupt. I, I didn't know it was a factual issue in terms of Carl, Carl. Well, let, let's hear you later. You've got to write a reply, Mr. Carlos, Mr. Slatter. Yeah. Mm. yeah. Uh, yes. What, what was your third point, Mr. Malik? Have you finished with your second? Uh, well, uh, uh, Lord. Uh, the, the general point, the, 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 the general point I've written down is not true that a refusal of ILR means that he becomes an overstayer in every case. Yes. Nor in these cases, and you gave. You said you had three points. One was the section three C point. Second was the point based on the facts of the particular cases, and I think you had a third point. But maybe I. Well, that 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 essentially case. was was the point that my Lord Lord Mr. Higginbottom made in the case of Srishta. Right, uh, uh, my Lord. That uh, is 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 a judgment that, in my respective submission, is is relevant. It is behind tab thirty eight of the bundle. You will see that that. Uh, two was a rule 3225 case where the application for indefinite leave remained. Yes, we haven't been shown it so far, so perhaps we ought to see it. So, which tab number? Uh, it's behind tab 38, volume 2. Uh, Lord, if you look at paragraph 17 of the judgment, this is page 1203. Uh, you'll see that uh, Mr. Srishta's application for indefinite leave to remain was refused under rules 3222 and rule 3225 yeah. uh, because of the discrepancy in the figures yeah. that were provided. Uh, precisely in the same manner as in these cases, uh, he uh, was issued with uh, a one stop <coughs> warning. Uh, he made uh, a human rights claim without putting in a formal application to leave to remain, uh, and then sought to argue uh, 
uh, that that was an effective human rights claim, which the Secretary of State was obliged to consider and determine. Uh, Sorry, just, just, just on the facts, um, uh, am I to remember that this was different, this case was different from the cases before us, uh, because it was not uh, eventually challenged um, that there had been um, deception. Is that right? The human rights claim wasn't didn't have as, as, as a factor. Um, no, I would not disown it. I should remember, but I'm afraid I can't remember. Uh, no, I mean all, all, all we have is, is what is recorded at paragraph 19 uh, that the response to the 120 notice included uh, various grounds on which. Uh, the applicant sought to rely, uh, and it's not immediately clear uh, that uh, that the point about the deception was also also pursued. But what what is relevant, uh, Lord, in my respectful submission, is that the argument uh, was rejected, and, and Lord Lord Higginbottom uh, considered the concession uh, made by the Secretary of State in the case of Arson uh, at paragraphs 31 and 32, uh, and and the conclusion, uh, Lords, is at. Uh, paragraph 33. Uh, so the submission uh, is that what was said at paragraph 33 is is correct uh, and, and applies to uh, these cases subject to the observation su subject of submissions that I've made. With, 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 with full force. Apart from questions of form and appropriate fee, yes. I'd just like help with this, please. What happens in real life to what the legal status of this human being is while they're in this country? So, so they've had the uh, ILR refused. Yes. Uh, let's say that they've got to the end of the administrative review process, so yes. Section 3C has brought their current leave to an end. Yes. And they, they respond, as you say, they must respond yes. with some kind of human rights claim using yes. the right form and the right fee. Yes. Um, even if it's not accepted, the decision making then takes a long time. Inevitably, it will take some time. Yes. So in, the, in the interim period, what happens to this person? Well, if, if that person is uh, Majumda, then he will be here lawfully because he had extent leave to remain. No, I understand that. But, but if that person is, is uh, Albert, then that person will be an overstayer. Uh, and, yes. and, and the point that my Lord, Lord Hickenbottom was making at paragraph 33 is that if that person feels that there are good grounds yes. for grant of leave on human rights grounds, then that person would make an application to the Secretary of State. But this is what the statutory scheme requires. But this proceeds on the assumption that and the point doesn't appear to have been argued, uh, that a Article 8 human rights claim will only arise at the moment of a removal decision, with a small d, but there, there isn't such a thing these days, but uh, steps being taken to remove him. What Mr Biggs's point has to be, and is, is that even before that, your Article 8 rights are being referred to, are being interfered with, for three reasons. One, that being liable to removal, in principle at any moment, is itself an interference with your Article 8 rights. Yes. You're not, Article 8 rights doesn't, uh, interference doesn't happen only at the moment when the men come to the door and take you to the airport. Secondly, uh, that you are subject to the hostile environment, which almost by definition, he yeah. would say, um, interferes with your Article 8 rights. And thirdly, reputation. Now, uh, none of those points appear to have been the issue in Fresta, yes. however it was pro it's pronounced. Yes. And that's really the case you, you, you have to meet. I, I do, and I see exactly what you say. You say, effectively, that an interference with Article 8 occurs only at the moment of the decision of the uh, removal process beginning. Uh, and not before that. But is that a realistic approach? Well, that, that in my submission, is, is the realistic approach in, in the three cases that I'm instructed in yes. for, for the reasons that I have given. Uh, uh, the, the case that Mr. Biggs is dealing with is, is obviously factually different from 
the other three cases. But in the other three cases, there's no doubt that it's not the yeah, consequence. Alexander wants to hear you say this. Because uh, <laughs> you may win your own three cases, but the point of principle um, is important for us. Yeah. And anything you have to say on that? <coughs> Well, I'm learning to send some missions on. on yes, yeah, she did. Yes, she uh, did. That's just that I, I, I thought. Forgive me, Mr. Marley. Yes. Sorry, had you finished that, your answer? Yes, I have. Yes, thank you. Uh, <coughs> I'm not sure. Well, I would necessarily accept that. I'm not sure I would necessarily accept that even on the fact of your cases, yeah. Article 8 doesn't arise, let's say. Because just, to, just suppose for the sake of argument, yes. and I'm not, I'm not saying what our view will be at all, Yes. that Mr. Biggs is right, yes. that for one or more reasons, the imposition of what is called the hostile environment, but might more accurately be said to be a number of statutory consequences which Parliament has said must follow from yes. the fact that somebody is here without permission. Right? Yes. Uh, uh, under the Human Rights Act, <coughs> even those who are here without any lawful right or permission have human rights. Yes. So, uh, what, what, what I'm interested in is what happens to a human being. Because that's what human rights is ultimately about, is, is what happens to ordinary human beings in real life. Uh, while their human rights claim is pending, yes. uh, and, and, and in, is, it, is it right that in the meantime, they can't have a bank account, they can't get a driving license, they can't work, they can't presumably access any state benefits, they can't access health care, without being charged for it. And we weren't told yesterday, but I'll assume that their children can go to school. I'm not sure about that. Um, but there's all this going on to them. As, I, as my Lord says, this is long before anyone comes to your house to take you to the airport. I mean, why isn't all of that, even assuming that they have no legal right to be here, yes. why isn't that an interference with people's Article 8 rights here and now? The, the, the answer, perhaps, is, is in paragraphs 30 and 33 of the judgment that we are looking at. If, and, and the submission would be that if, if a person in that position takes the view that he has a, a good Article 8 claim, yes. uh, he has a right uh, to be in the United Kingdom on that basis, uh, then the statutory scheme requires that person to make that claim to the Secretary of State. Uh, uh, Lord Lord Sunder Hill uh, asked, and Ms. Henderson as to the statutory basis of, of the requirement to make an application. Uh, the, 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 those are, are discussed at paragraph 30, where there's a reference to section 50 of the 2002 Act. And, oh, that's and the very helpful. Tools. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yes, well, they, that, that's very useful. Thank you. Uh, uh, link, link, I'm link. Sorry, just, just you don't need the notes then. Yeah. Yes. Just, just to follow that through. Yes. So, so what, what you say, based on this case, what you say is that. Um, uh, it, it, in the, once the uh, ILR application, which doesn't yeah. raise human rights at all, yes, um, you, you say, um, is uh, determined negatively. Yes. Uh, then the applicant has got um, t two choices in terms of Article Eight. Firstly, uh, he can make an Article Eight claim in proper form with the proper fee. It yes. will be dealt with, uh, and it will be an appealable decision. Yes. Alternative, let's say he doesn't do that, um, a, a, and then removal steps are taken. Uh, he can then challenge the removal steps um, uh, on Article 8 grounds, and that too will be a, a, an appealable decision. Yes. Can you help me with this, then? What are the removal steps? Um, a, a, after these decisions, after the, after the paragraph 3225 yes. is taken, yes. Um, yes. the individual is liable to remove. Yes. Um, uh, but there's no section 10 now. Yes. Um, yes. So what triggers the yes. the Article 8 um, issue in those circumstances? Yes. Uh, Lord, may, 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 I, may I answer this question by taking my Lord to, to one of the notices that were issued to uh, one of the appellants in these cases? Yes. And that, and that says, uh, if you go to page 1452, uh, this is volume 2. <laughs> Page 
eight one four five two. One four five two. Yes. It's not. It's not. Sorry, yeah, I, I do, but it, it's one four two five. One four two five. Yes. So this is uh, the decision in the case of Majumdar, uh, and if you look at uh, page one four two nine, uh, you see a heading enforcement warning. The Secretary of State is not saying that Mr. Majumdar is liable to removal. The Secretary of State is saying uh, that Mr. Majumdar has 14 days to apply for administrative review and he is not required to leave the United Kingdom during this time. Well, yes, but uh, if he doesn't, he does say that, 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 that it's a fair point, obviously, that it is all subject to the administrative review timetable. Yes. Subject to that, it is saying you are liable uh, uh, to be removed. And that, that's, that's, that's Mr. Bidge's first point, that that in itself is a breach of Article 8. If, if, if you look at the heading, liability for removal, at page yes. 1429, what is said uh, in the first paragraph under that heading is true, that if a person has no leave to remain, then that person is liable to removal, not, not Mr. Mujumda, of course, because he had leave. And then uh, it says that if a person becomes an overstayer, then he may be detained, placed in reporting conditions. Uh, and uh, that he is not required to leave the United Kingdom uh, during the time uh, in which he may apply for administrative review. Uh, then there's adding consequences of illegally staying in the United Kingdom. Yeah, and then, then there's the so-called hostile environment. I, I, yeah. I, I see all that. Um, so page but page. I think my Lord may have been asking a slightly different question, and if he wasn't, I, one interests me yeah. is, you're liable to removal, subject to the administrative review timetable, from the moment of the, uh, this decision. Yes. If you are actually going to be removed, I think what Mr Biggs told us is the current thing is you're now given a notice of removal window. Yes. And that, we, I'm not sure we've got an example in here because none of them have got to that point, no. but that basically says you may be removed at any stage within these... After that. Uh, and, the, and, the, and then the third thing you get is actual removal directions. Yes when a particular plane is specified. Yeah. Um, uh, I don't know whether, but that, that, that's correct, is it? That is correct, yes. Yes, yes. yes. And, and just, just for completeness, if I may, may ask my lords to also look at page 114. Um, so when an application is refused, uh, it, it comes with, uh, with, with a warning, which, which is different from uh, the other <coughs> that I showed you. It also says that if there are other reasons why an applicant wishes to reside in the United Kingdom, and that person can make an application. Uh, now, of course, it, it's, it's relevant to have regard to the fact that these appellants chose to make an application for indefinite leave to remain under the points based system. It was obviously open to them to make a human rights application instead of an application. Oh, but they wouldn't know they needed to, would they? They think, let's just, let's just assume, not of course what the Secretary of State says, says that, that in fact they, they are and believe themselves to be innocent of any misrepresentation. Yes. They uh, simply make a points-based system application which is in every other respect perfect and bound as a matter of law to succeed. Why would I but they make a, a human rights application alongside? Just a waste of, waste of time and money. That, 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 of course, is, is a matter for, for an applicant. But, but, but so far as, as the Secretary of State is concerned, the Secretary of State has no application uh, made on human rights grounds. And yeah, well, that, it, that I see. Yes. But I think, I think what we put to Ms. Anderson is that the way in which this could come up in practice would be that if there was a minded to letter, yes. there could be an equivalent of a section 120 <laughs> notice with that. That is to say, uh, any other things we ought to take into account at the same time. But, but, but I do, do ask my lords to consider the, the implications of, of, of that view. Uh, my lord, Lord Sander Hill will, will recall that in Arson, at paragraph 118, uh, my lord said, that what was being said in that case 
would not apply to every single case and it's not that yeah. in every single case where deception is alleged, Article 8 is engaged and applicant is entitled to yeah. a fact-finding uh, tribunal hearing. But yet, of course, we, 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 are, we are before this court uh, with, with the same arguments. So if, if, if uh, my lords are to say that a minded to refuse letter is needed in these cases, then what, where, where would, where would that, that end? Uh, a tier two applicant who is refused leave to remain uh, would make the same argument. So would a, 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 a tier four applicant. Take the example of uh, the appellant in the case of Adi Doyen. He had a previous criminal conviction failed to disclose that criminal conviction in his application, the Secretary of State would be obliged uh, on, on this analysis to write to that applicant to say that, well, you haven't disclosed your criminal conviction. Can you please explain whether it was intentional, whether it was dishonest, so that I can decide whether or not uh, the general grounds of refusal would apply. Uh, take the example of, of Mr. Giri. Uh, he had a previous uh, refusal of an application for leave to remain. Uh, he, in his application that was subject to that, that judicial review claim, said that there wasn't any earlier decision. In that sort of case, uh, will uh, the, the, the same minded to refuse procedure apply? What about a person who has breached an immigration condition? Uh, the Secretary of State is satisfied on the evidence that there was a breach. The Secretary of State on this analysis will be obliged to write to the applicant asking for reasons as to why there was a breach. Uh, what about a decision taken on the basis that a person is not a genuine student or, or, or a genuine employee or, 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 or his earnings are I not take your point, uh, and we need to think about these things, but there might be said to be an important distinction between dishonesty and other forms of um, uh, well, grounds for refusal. Well, that, 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 Lord, I, I appreciate, and that is the reason I gave examples of Adi Doyen and Giri. Both were cases where dishonesty was alleged. But how would this, an allegation of dishonesty uh, in reality is different in consequences from an allegation that a person has breached uh, his, his immigration conditions or that his, uh, the, uh, the vacancy, uh, job vacancy is not genuine or, or that is fraudulent. So there is, in my respectful submission, no end uh, on, 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 on this analysis. Uh, and. Uh, and if, 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 if my learned friends are right, then Article 8 would be engaged in every single case, even in, in a case of a student who has been here for a few years on, on the analysis of Mr. Biggs on the low threshold. I think, of well, I think department. that he's right. I, I, I mean, Article 8 will be engaged in any case where the person has developed a significant yeah. private life, uh, or, at, or it may be family life, but just leave private life to make it simple, um, which will be interfered with by their removal yes. on Mr. Biggs. Uh, and I think you must be right about that. That is not every case, however. Uh, it, students, it depends. Um, but certainly, simply by being a student, you don't get any Article 8 rights. Uh, and other types of shorter-term leave. Article 8 might not be engaged in the first place. But I suppose your point would be, nevertheless, yeah. they could assert it was, and you'd have to have a hearing to find out. Uh, absolutely. And, and yes. Lord, Lord Sanders Hill actually in Austin said that Article 8 would be engaged even <coughs> in the cases involving students. <coughs> Austin, after all, well, was a case involving... Say quite that, but we said they could be in student yeah. cases. Yeah. Uh, so that... that and, and then, in, 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 in just, just considering this at, at a practical level, the, the analysis would, would apply to all categories uh, and the applicants uh, would be seeking for a fact-finding hearing before the upper tribunal in the circumstances where parliament took the decision to take away uh, the, the appeal rights uh, by uh, the 2014 Act. I mean, uh, is, is another way of putting the submission, and, and tell me if it's not, because it may not be, that um, the real issue is not whether Article 8 is engaged. Yes. Uh, but whether the Secretary of State uh, cannot uh, have uh, a system of, uh, of immigration application that effectively exclude, take out of the equation Article 8 um, uh, on the basis that Article 8 is dealt with uh, in a different way. I and mean, that's that 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 is that's, that's 
That's daily murder. <coughs> yes, that, that is the point. And perhaps just, just, just linked, linked with, with that point, of course, I appreciate the observation that Lord Lord Sandra Hill, uh, sorry, uh, Lord Lord Higginbottom made that, well, if you don't deal with Article 8 claim at the time of the refusal of ILA, it gets very complicated. Why should a person become an overstayer, then make a human rights claim, uh, and then uh, a right of appeal? Uh, well, what, what's the logic behind that? But well, the, the, I'm sorry to interrupt, but your answer is because that's what Parliament has said. Yes, um, but Parliament's taken away yes. rights of appeal in all of these cases except Article 8. Yes, so yes. They can hive off Article 8. Well, absolutely, but, but, but there is, there is, there is, there is there's another point uh, that, that I can make in response, which is that these are precisely the sort of arguments that were made uh, eight years ago in, in a series of cases that were uh, dealt with by this court, starting with Daily Murder and, and Mirza, uh, and, and those cases were ultimately decided uh, in Fadeo. Sorry, sorry, how did you finish? Uh, uh, Lord, I'm, I'm happy to, to go through. I, 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 this may or may not be a good point, but, but at least, speaking for myself, I think it may be important always to keep in mind a distinction between procedural issues, such as where, if anywhere, is there a right of appeal, <coughs> and substantive law issues. Mm -hmm. Now, whatever Parliament has decided about appeal routes, yes. one, thing par one thing Parliament has not done is repeal or amend Section 6 of the Human Rights Act. I, I, I so the substantive obligation on every public authority, yes. which includes the Secretary of State for the Home Department, to comply with people's convention rights yes, and, and, continues and, and, in full force. And, and the submission, of course, is that the procedure that is in place uh, with the backing of the statute, namely Section 50 of the 2006 Act and the Immigration Rules, complies with that obligation. It requires an applicant to make a human rights claim to the Secretary of State. The Secretary of State will decide no, that. I appreciate claim. all of that. But in the meantime, someone will be left uh, possibly for a long time, they will be left with, with all the other uh, sanctions that yes. apply to them because they have no right or <coughs> permission to be here. Well, uh, Lord, th these are precisely the points that uh, Lord Justice Sedley uh, made in the case of Mirza, which was followed by Sapkuta, and ultimately those cases were decided by the Supreme Court in the case of Pate may, may, may I take you to Patel, yeah. perhaps, and, and just show you a couple of passages that, that may assist uh, my Lord, in relation to, to that question. Yes. Uh, Padel is, is behind that 26, uh, volume 2. I'm sorry, it's, it's, it's volume 1. Tab. Uh, tab 26. Thank you. Lord Patel was a case where the Secretary of State refused a person's in-time application for leave to remain without issuing a removal decision. And Mr. Patel argued that the failure to issue a removal decision at the same time as refusing leave to remain was unlawful because of uh, the reasons my Lord Lord Singh was highlighting, namely that immediately after refusal of the application subject to Section 3C leave, that person becomes an overstayer, He's not entitled to work. He's not entitled to access um, benefits and so on and so forth. And it's 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 unfair and it makes no sense to to segregate the two decisions. Uh, if you go to uh, page uh, six six five of the report uh, uh, and and look at paragraph twenty six, uh, you'll see that in that paragraph, Lord Conworth summarised uh, the decisions taken in Mirza and Sapruta. Uh, in those cases, this court held uh, that uh, an unjustified segregation of two decisions for the sort of reasons that my Lord Lord Singh had in mind was unlawful. Uh, I, I, I don't want to stop your citation of this at all, but it, it, it's my fault. I may not have explained the question that I was putting. But mine isn't the same point that I think the Supreme Court was addressing here. Uh, my question is simply this. Do you accept that substantive obligations on the Secretary of State to comply with the Human Rights Act continue with full force at all times? And, and well, first of all, do you accept that question? 
Yes. Yes, right. And do you accept that the, the Human Rights Act protects people who are here illegally? Absolutely. Yes. Right. So the consequence procedurally, insofar as one is concerned with procedural consequences, may simply be that we're all going to have to live with the fact that the, the, the remedy is an application for judicial review. And uh, even though it might be uh, convenient, expedient, practically helpful, if we could devise a system for there to be an appeal route to the FTT, if that can't be done, then I think what you're accepting is that they're, they're in principle, somebody could complain by way of uh, claim for judicial review and the forum would be the upper tribunal. Yes, I cannot, cannot, cannot disagree right. with, with, right. with that analysis, but, but the submission based on Patel is, is that the segregation of two decisions is, is, is held to be justified and, yes. and, 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 and lawful. Yes, I see. Yes, well that, that yeah. is highly material to the point that we've been considering about the root of challenge. But we then come come back to my Lord's point that in that case the only consequence is that uh, all material issues have to be dealt with including any human rights issues in the in the judicial review is that not correct assuming the human rights issues are properly raised mm. okay. well then then of course the, the, the effect of the effect of that would be that uh, a, a, a person who hasn't made a human rights claim to the Secretary of State will be able to go to the upper tribunal uh, to say that his human rights uh, are being violated by the decision to refuse him indefinitely to remain. Gives him the gives him the right to complain of a decision which is contrary to Article Eight. Yes, but but one in <coughs> course the and, and then it is of course for, for the reviewing court to decide whether in the circumstances, it would be appropriate to convert uh, a fact, a converted judicial review in a fact finding. Hearing, yes, well, then that, whether it yes. would be appropriate to yes. uh, uh, defer to what, what Parliament has said. And, 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 and the point that, that was made in, in the skeleton uh, also concerns the scheme of Section 94 of the 2002 Act and Section 96. So Parliament has decided, legislated, that if a person makes a hopeless human rights claim to the Secretary of State, the Secretary of State would certify it, and that person will not get an in-country right of appeal. If there is a, if the human rights claim is not made at the right time, the Secretary of State will certify it under Section 94 so that the person will not get a right of appeal at all. So it would be odd in my respect to submission that a person who would make a human rights claim to the Secretary of State uh, may uh, get his human rights claim certified under Section 94 or Section 96. But a person who would not make a human rights claim to the Secretary of State at all would be able to go to the upper tribunal to have a fact-finding hearing in the circumstances where uh, yeah. Parliament legislated yeah, I, I to, to avoid... As you say, the point was made in the status argument, but hasn't, hasn't yet come out. Uh, uh, <coughs> yes. Yes, I that's, a, that's only if they got a proper cause of action to get into judicial. Yes, but we're envisaging a scenario yes. here when they. Yes. Uh, no, uh, I'm now we got a lot. I'm speaking myself. I find it very helpful. So it's no no way a criticism of, of you, but we got a long way, I suspect, from the points you were intending to deal with, or perhaps you were intending to deal with exactly these points. Uh, how much more do you want to say uh, Lord, uh, on the general points? Three, three, three further points, Lord. Uh, the, the first point uh, out of the remaining three concerns what my lord, lord Sandhill said about arson litigation. Uh, my lord asked why a concession was made in that case uh, and, and why the Secretary of State's position has now changed and what, what's, what's different. Uh, the context is different. My lord, lord Sandhill, uh, in arson paragraph 118, made it clear uh, that it's not that in every single case where deception is alleged, in Article 8 is engaged, that person is entitled to a fact-finding hearing before the upper tribunal. Everything would depend on the context. Now, the context in which arson was decided uh, was this, that the Secretary of State had made removal decisions on the basis of the evidence that was 
described by the upper tribunal as <coughs> flimsy. There was a dispute about the underlying evidence provided by the ETS who issued uh, the, the, the certificate in questions. In these cases, there isn't any dispute about uh, the reliability of, of the evidence. It is not suggested that the information that HMRC has provided is, is defective or unreliable in any sense. There were, uh, again, uh, as, as Malors would, would know from Austin litigation, uh, 48,000 uh, suspected fraudulent English language certificates. Uh, whereas uh, in, in these cases, as, as it is clear from the review, uh, the total number of the refusals are just over 1,600 in, in, in total. In the context of that litigation, where there was a dispute about the underlying ev evidence, uh, the Secretary of State took the decision entirely pragmatically that those are the sort of cases that should go to the first year tribunal. But that does not mean that the same would apply to this case. But if, if Malors are to find that the same approach applies to this case, then a tier two migrant tomorrow would say that the same is true for him. A tier four migrant, a domestic worker, would argue for, 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 the, for, the, same, uh, for, for, for the same approach. Uh, Lord, uh, just second, second last point, uh, which, which, which concerns uh, the questions that uh, Malord raised as to uh, the difference between curtailment of leave and, and refusal of leave to remand. And, and Malord Lord Sandhill, uh, sorry, Malord Lord Singh uh, observed that uh, what this court would say about Rule 3225 would apply also with full force to curtailment decisions. The difference, and, and uh, Malord Lord Sand, uh, Hickenbottom, asked for an example as to the circumstances where the Secretary of State, despite concluding that a person's conduct uh, is questionable, would not curtail that, that person's leave. Uh, there is, of course, a difference in uh, refusal of leave provisions and curtailment provisions. The refusal of leave provisions fall under the heading should normally be refused. Curtailment provisions fall under the heading the Secretary of State may curtail a person's leave. So there is no presumption of curtailment in, in these cases. And, and Majumda is the example uh, that uh, perhaps my Lord Lord Sahin Bottom uh, was, was looking for. So Majumda is a case where the Secretary of State took the view that his conduct was questionable. It was undesirable for him to be given leave to remain. The Secretary of State refused his application. But he had extant leave to remain for a number of months. The Secretary of State decided not to curtail that leave. Uh, uh, so that, that uh, of course, is, is the difference between, uh, between the two uh, uh, categories. Uh, just just final, uh, finally, Milord, in, in, in relation to uh, uh, the points as, as to the fairness uh, that Milord and friends for the appellants have made, uh, as, as Ms. Anderson said, uh, fairness is, is always a context and, and fact specific. Now, in, in the three cases uh, that, that I'm instructed in, in my respective submission, one has to have regard to the fact uh, that although there were no minded to refuse letters, it was always open to the appellants to make fresh applications to the Secretary of State without becoming an overstayer in relation to Majumda and, and, and Kaos. Because they had extant leave, they could have applied for further leave to remain before expiry of their leaves as, as uh, Majumda has done. Uh, whereas uh, Albert was, was already an overstayer. And, and, and in my respectful submission, uh, therefore, the argument as to fairness should be looked at in, in that context. Uh, a, a, a relevant authority on, on, on the subject is, is uh, the judgment of uh, Lord Lord Justice Singh in the case of Patan. Uh, I will not take you to that authority. It's behind uh, tab 35. Uh, that, uh, as Lord would recall, uh, was a case where uh, a tier two applicant applied for further leave to remain. The Secretary of State refused that person's application on the basis that the sponsorship license of his employer was refused. Uh, and my lord will, will recall that one of the two cases that were before uh, this court, the appellant was already an overstayer. And, and, and the court took the view that the, the arguments as to the fairness would not apply to a person who is already an overstayer in the same way as they would apply to a person who is residing in the United Kingdom lawfully. Are there any particular paragraphs? Uh, paragraphs 
50, 51, and... Just and the relevances eight. will do. 50, 51. Uh, sorry. It's... Uh, 51 and, and, and 42. Thank you. Uh, may, I, may I just, just double-check if, if the references are correct? Uh, yes, pa paragraphs 50, 51 and 52. Uh, so it, 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 for, 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 for the reasons given in those paragraphs, in my respectful submission, uh, the arguments as to the fairness do, do not arise in the same way as they arise in other cases, in the case of Albert, because he was already uh, okay. an, 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 an overstayer. Uh, now, so those are your general points, save, I suppose, I know you have a self-contained group of points on tame side. Yes. I, I don't think we, I think we're sufficiently familiar with what the issues are there, though we won't stop you addressing us in due course, um, to now get an indication from Ms. Nike. I have no idea what time is it. It's 3.37. 3.37. About what you would wish to address us on, or if you're not allowed to address us on, which bits of the um, uh, uh, of your written submissions uh, you believe add value to what we've heard already. Uh, well, I think my, uh, Mr. S um, Malik's submissions have really demonstrated what the importance of this intervention and the the application for this. Well, no generalities. Uh, Just tell us what so you want to address us on. Specifically, the impact statements that we have from a t sample of 10. Okay, persons. that's right, the impact statements, and yes. Seven what, out of those 10 persons are subject to the hostile environment. Uh, I understand. That's one yes, point. What, what's the other point you want um, to address? And us then, on? And then also, the, the comments that we have to make submissions on the Home Office Review, which haven't been made in the way that I would like to make them very briefly. What sort of, I don't want you to make the submissions, to, but what sorts of points? The, the sorts of points go to the volume of error identified by the Secretary of State himself, and also to the numbers of appeals that have succeeded on human, human rights grounds yeah. in the first tier tribunal, which demonstrate that there is, the remedies in this case are very particularly important. Which yes, important thank you, that's helpful. Um, and the invocation of, the, of Rule 3225 generally the long-standing rule, which is we said sledgehammer to crack a nut. We just said it's in, in, fe in effect the use of this rule, which is a blanket rule for, to cover a number of categories in this particular context, brings about particularly harsh non-human rights compliant decisions because you're inevitably refusing ILR to people who've been here for a long time, who came in a category... Well, sorry, no, you're, you're, this, is, this is just general. No, what is the particular point on which you can add value by making a submission. My Lord. I've got, you want you want the impact statement, you've got that. You want to look at the Home Office report to show us the volume of error yes. and the um, uh, and the nature of the successful the cases. Office, yes, sorry, within the Home Office report, there's also reference to the, the reason why the rule was used, and it's a long-standing rule. Yes. The procedural fairness arguments, which, which the impact of the lack of procedural fairness is a, demonstrated by Ms. Fizza Qureshi's statement, which talks about the impact on the individual. Well, that's going back to impact statements. Yes. Uh, but it's, she, she's done a more a summary of the 176 people who were surveyed okay, as opposed to just yes. the actual 10 impact statements. Uh, I've got two points to make on the nationality guidance because there is a procedure within that which requires an okay, explanation. Just a point about nationality, nationality guidance. guidance. Yep. Um, a particular point about the impact on children and whether the Secretary of State should be required to engage with the impact on children mm -hmm. and why. Right. Is um, that your shopping list of points um, you'd like to yes, address? Yes, so and I've got. I can address you on Patel, but how, what, why we say Patel can be distinguished? That's that's a bigger point. So maybe Mr. Biggs can deal with that. Thank you. Right. We will rise and decide how we want to deal with the rest of the day. Thank you. Yeah.
decided how we can uh, most uh, usefully use the uh, remaining uh, time, uh, uh, dealing first with um, the intervener. Uh, speaking for myself, I found um, the uh, parts of the intervention, um, written intervention, uh, helpful, and just speak for, for all of us. Uh, and However, insofar as it uh, deals with points which have already been dealt with um, by the Claimants Council very effectively, or which can be dealt with by them, uh, we see no additional value in um, uh, hearing from uh, Ms. Nike. Uh, uh, nice as it would be if we had more time. Insofar as it does introduce wholly new material, such as the impact statement questionnaire uh, and issues about uh, the impact on children and nationality guidance. Uh, those matters are not uh, formally within the scope of the existing appeals. To allow them to be introduced now would um, disrupt what is uh, a hearing where there's very limited time uh, available and we will uh, therefore pay no regard to those parts of the uh, uh, intervention which we read de Bene Esse. Uh, I want it to be quite clearly understood by those who uh, Ms. Nike represents that one important part of the uh, references to the impact statements and the questionnaire is to bring home to us 
the uh, impact uh, that uh, being in limbo for a long period and uh, subject to uh, what I will call, without any, making any value judgment, but just for shorthand, the hostile environment provisions can have on individuals. Uh, I have uh, myself and I employ, I speak for all the members of the court, no difficulty in appreciating uh, that in general. Uh, and uh, we fully understand uh, why those matters are so important to those affected by them. But I do not think we need to read the impact statements or the questionnaire uh, in order um, to give further particulars of a general point that we are very well aware of. Um, so, Ms. Knight, I'm sorry you sat here for a, a long time and are not going to be allowed to address us, uh, but I think that is the right course in the circumstances of the case. Well, well, you have the, the materials that we've submitted, and I hope they are some assistance in reaching a general conclusion, which I think yes. is very positive. Thank you very thank much. You. Thank you. Um, now, uh, it does not seem to us that we will be able to do justice to the facts of the individual cases in the remaining time. What we therefore propose is that uh, uh, Mr. Malik will address us on the Tameside point, which I think he can do, and we would invite him to do very briefly. Uh, we will then hear a reply primarily from Mr. Biggs, though in principle uh, the uh, other council will be entitled to, on the uh, general issues. Uh, and uh, we will then obviously be reserving our judgments. In the course of doing that, we will consider whether we can uh, reach a decision on the individual cases without hearing from the Secretary of State. Uh, if we uh, uh, can't, we will ask for further written submissions, to which then there will obviously have to be submissions in reply. And in the light of those, we may need to have a further hearing on the facts of one or more of the individual cases. But we don't want to hear any more about the facts of the individual cases in this hearing because uh, there isn't the time to do so fairly to the individuals concerned. Can I just raise one matter? Um, in fact, I think my learned friend was more than doing the payment side. I think he was more going to focus on seeing the procedural fairness point in the individual cases, not going in detail into their facts, but just um, elaborating that, and it may be, um, rather than spending time on payment side, that may be more um, useful. Well, I think we must, yeah, yeah, I'm sure you, uh, in principle, the dividing line is between matters going to address the general issues uh, and uh, matters peculiar to the individual cases. We can't stop Mr. Malik illustrating general points by reference to the individual case. He's done a little bit of that already. And if that's what he wants to do, that's what he must do. But that's what the focus is. Yeah. Otherwise, we will not have the time to deal with the remaining general points, let alone the individual cases. So I hope that's a sufficient guidance. Yeah, well, it was certainly how we planned it, that we'd raise the headline points and procedural fairness, but you know, they would be put in Well, the more we talk about it now, Ms. Anderson, yeah. the less time we have to do it. So, yes, Mr. Malik. Uh, Lord, you, you have you have the submissions on on the Thames side point in in our skeleton argument. Uh, yes. And I, I do not propose to repeat those submissions, paragraphs ninety five to, to ninety eight. Um, may, may I, uh, perhaps in 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 five minutes or so, uh, just to uh, give give you headline uh, uh, points uh, that 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 may assist in relation to the three cases that, that you have before the board. Um, yes, but you understand the spirit of what we're saying. Yeah. If we're going to have to decide those cases, yeah. yes. we will, we will get, we, uh, and if there's a chance we will decide them as we're against you, we yeah. will hear you fully on them anyway yeah. in writing. Uh, so I, I really only want the individual cases to the extent that yeah. they illustrate points that you want to make yeah about the correct approach. Okay. Uh, now, with, 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 with that in mind, uh, may, I, may I show you uh, the decision letter in the case of Albert, not, not to make any specific points yes, about that, that decision, uh, but simply to say that uh, that uh, is 
precisely the sort of decisions that the Secretary of State should be making in all these cases. Yes, certainly. Uh, um, the so decision, Lord, is at page 1593 of the bundle. Again, without, without going into the facts, you will see that the decision that uh, deals with six particular points, and, and, and these are the sort of points that the Secretary of State uh, should be dealing with in, in these sort of cases. First, uh, see uh, the second half of page 1594, uh, and the first few paragraphs of page 1593, the Secretary of State identifies the discrepancy. Yes. Secondly, the Secretary of State identifies the evidence submitted by the applicant. So, sorry, I, 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 uh, just give me, the, wh wh where's the, where does the identification of yes. the discrepancy starts at? Page 1594, yep. uh, right at the end, last two paragraphs. Yep. And then the first four lines at page 1593. Yep. So there is an identification of discrepancy. Um, so 4,000 was underdeclared in 2010-2011, and 15,000 plus was underdeclared in 2012-2013. The Secretary of State then, in the next paragraph, secondly, identified the evidence put <coughs> forward by the applicant, namely the accountant's letter. Thirdly, uh, this is the middle of that page. Which page, sorry? Uh, page 1595. Yeah. The Secretary of State considers whether the discrepancy is significant, says that, well, there's a significant difference. <coughs> uh, you, you'll see the paragraph starting with care, careful consideration has been yep. given. Uh, fourthly, the Secretary of State acknowledges expressly uh, the subsequent amendments. That's the next paragraph. Uh, fifthly, the Secretary of State expressly engages with the explanation and the evidence. Uh, these are the last two paragraphs at page 1593 yeah. and rejects that explanation. And finally, sixthly, on the next page, the Secretary of State expressly uh, recognizes that there is a discretion, says that the decision is not a mandatory decision, uh, but then says that discretion was exercised to refuse the decision. Yeah. Uh, so this, in my respectful submission, is a classic example of a lawful decision that uh, is, is, is to be taken in these cases. Uh, you say that's typical. Actually, this isn't typical because this is one where there has been, because of the particular history in yes. Mr. Albert's case, a prehistory and an explanation given in the context of that prehistory. That's not, in fact, typical, is it? Uh, well, uh, well, even, even in, 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 well, it, it is, Lord, uh, in the sense that even, even where the questionnaires were issued, an applicant would, would give some sort of explanation, would provide some, some evidence, and the Secretary of State would, would consider that. I mean, I... Well, would they? Sorry, I mean, not... Are we, not, are we, are we, are we at cross-purposes? In Mr. Albert's case, yes. uh, so the, we the, haven't... This is the second... This is the decision no, challenged. No, no. If yes. we went back and looked at the original decision, yes. we wouldn't find any, any looking at his explanation because there wasn't an explanation. So he, he was given a questionnaire to complete, which he completed and submitted. But that's not an explanation of the discrepancy. Uh, well, yes, but, but the, 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 the submission, if, if, if I may put it in this way, is that where, I mean, of course, you, you, you make a decision as to the points as, as to fairness in, in, in due course, but my submission is that where an applicant submits uh, evidence and explanation, this is the sort of the decision yes, I see. that okay. well, uh, should, yeah. should be taken. Uh, Miller and friend, Mr. Uh, Saini, uh, uh, said this, and again, uh, not not dealing with the facts, but but in a general sense, he uh, sort of sort of suggests that well, it was the first tax return of of Mr. Albert. That is a typical argument that that any applicant would make. That well, this was the first time I was completing a tax return. I was here only for for a few years. Uh, but those sort of arguments in my submission would would not assist in in any of these cases because it's it's always the case that an applicant. We'll have we'll have a, a first tax return, and these are highly skilled uh, migrants. Uh, taking the example of, of Mr. Albert, he uh, did a, a BSc in business and, and computing. So that is the context in which the Secretary of State would consider uh, 
the the explanation. Uh, and and it, it, even even if even if one uh, gives a, a, a margin relation to the first ever tax return, uh, then what about uh, the fourth tax return that was submitted where the discrepancy was was fifteen thousand pounds? Well, I, we I think you really are with respect yeah. um, arguing the facts of a particular case. It's not going to help us in the general issues which we are going to have to decide. So, Lord, I, 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 perhaps I'll, 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 I'll end here. And may, may, I, may I move on to, uh, again, to, to, to the next case, Majumdar, rather than making any points about the facts, because Majumdar's case represents a different class of cases in the sense that there wasn't uh, a, a, a discrepancy in the sense that no information was given to HMRC uh, at all, uh, and a tax return was filed late, and Miller and Mr. Kareem says that that case uh, is, is different from, from other cases. Yes, and and, and it, it's, it's true that th those are the sort of cases that uh, uh, are, 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 are here. So my, my short submission, again, in a general sense, would be that there is no principled basis to distinguish those sort of cases from the other cases that the court is dealing with. If, uh, if a person gives false information to HMRC, uh, as to his earnings to pay tax, uh, if that person can be refused under Rule 3225, uh, why, one wonders, uh, the provision would not apply to a person who simply gives no information to HMRC as to his earnings and thereby uh, avoid paying, paying the tax. Uh, Miller and Friend, uh, in support of his argument, uh, referred you to the case of Williams. Uh, I will not take you to the authority, it's behind uh, tab. 78 of the bundle, uh, when you will look at that case in due course, you will see that that case was completely different from the case that Mr. Kareem uh, was dealing with. In that case, there was an interview, and the Secretary of State, after the interview, found Mr. Williams to be a credible person, and yet refused the application, uh, despite the fact that there was a positive credibility finding. And the upper tribunal in that case, in that context, held that the decision wasn't, wasn't justified. Uh, now, uh, finally, uh, the case of uh, Kaos perhaps is, 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 is a good example uh, to test uh, the, the, the fairness arguments in the sense that in that case, uh, subject to uh, the point about questionnaire, the applicant wasn't able to put forward any evidence or explanation before the refusal of his application. He put forward evidence and explanation in his administrative review application. The upper tribunal looked at that evidence and looked at that explanation. The upper tribunal's decision uh, is at, at page 551, and I ask my lords to look at paragraphs 52, 55, 56, and 61. The upper tribunal said that the evidence, the new evidence that wasn't before the Secretary of State, which the Secretary of State was not obliged to consider, does not exist. So I, I, even if even if the court concludes that well, uh, again we're coming into the facts, not 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 on the facts, but even if, if even if the court concludes in a general sense that uh, a failure to send a minded to refuse letter would be unlawful, uh, uh, surely the upper tribunal or the reviewing court can look at the new evidence well, and it may well be if this is your point that uh, even if we were to say that. In every case, there has to be an opportunity of a kind which is not routinely given yes. um, to uh, meet the allegation of dishonesty. It may be, but we won't decide this without giving the opportunity for further submissions, that in particular cases, because for some idiosyncratic reason there was an interview, as there was in Kawas, uh, uh, there was no unfairness. Yes. Uh, I can see that. So. Uh, one would have to look at what procedure was followed in any particular case. Yes. Just, just, just to conclude, and, 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 and that's it. it, it even, even if there is, there is procedural unfairness in the sense that an applicant wasn't given the opportunity to provide evidence, if the reviewing court takes the view that the explanation is manifestly implausible, as was the case in Majumda uh, and, and, and Kaos, then judicial review must, must fail in principle. Uh, because On the basis, the result would have been the same in any event. Yes, and when, well, when you look at the two decisions, you will see that this is precisely what the upper tribunal did. Consider the new evidence said that the explanation was... Yes, well, Mr. This is, well, this is a general point, and Mr. Biggs did refer us to the line of authorities 
it was actually a more recent case, but it's the, the, the case that goes back to John and Rees. Um, but I suppose this is slightly different. You're saying it's not just there couldn't be an explanation, which is a very dangerous thing to say, but we now know what the explanation would have been, and we see it's hopeless, yes. and therefore we're not going to quash the decision. That, that's the line of argument you're saying is, is OK. Yes. Is that right? Yes, and, and you may have, of course, you have seen the reference to Section 31A of the Senior Courts Act in the skeleton argument. Yes. The reviewing court has to decide whether uh, it's highly likely that the outcome for the applicant would be substantially different. If, considering the explanation and evidence, the upper tribunal takes the view, uh, as it took the view in these cases, that the outcome wouldn't be different. Uh, the upper tribunal, in my submission, uh, should, in principle, uh, decline to grant judicial review. Yeah, well, thank you. That's helpful. Uh, no, the, the, these are these are the general points. I haven't I haven't dealt with with the facts. Uh, no, uh, that's uh, I stick by what I said. Um, you will have an opportunity to deal with the facts of the particular cases <coughs> if it's material. Yes, Mr. B. Yes, I'm, I'm grateful for my laws. Um, I'll be as brief as I can, and I, I do think I can be relatively brief. But I want to cover uh, four things. The first thing is the nature of paragraph 3225. In my submission, the way the Secretary of State has presented the arguments, at least um, the way that my learned friend, Mr. Anders Anderson, has presented the arguments, suggests that paragraph 3225 is actually about a general character requirement that can be applied into, in, implied into more specific rules. That, in my submission, is a fundamentally wrong way to look at paragraph 3225. Paragraph 3225 does what it says it does. And it means what it says. It's about the Secretary of State's view that a person's very presence in the UK is undesirable. It's not about the Secretary of State's view that it would be inappropriate to grant, in these cases, indefinite leave to remain on the basis that the Secretary of State is not satisfied that the person is of good character. And so that's a very important distinction because it addresses my learned friend Ms. Anderson's suggestion that um, it would be disproportionate or inappropriate to grant indefinite leave to remain in these cases. Um, it, it also shows why, or one reason why, the, Al, the, the instant cases are a I the Al-Fayed case. Because in the Al-Fayed case, the Secretary of State was entitled, in fact, there was a statutory requirement um, uh, imposing this, to expect applicants for, 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 for naturalization to meet a good character requirement. And particular grounds for refusing, uh, for saying that that requirement wasn't met had been advanced by the Secretary of State. Whereas in this case, um, there is no doubt that the Secretary of State is making a particular allegation, and it's, it's broader and has more draconian consequences than an allegation that a person might not be of good character. So there's been no satisfaction in the Secretary of State's mind as to the person's character. The allegation under 3225 is that the person's presence in the UK is undesirable. And that, as I explained in my principal submission yesterday, is the first reason why Article 8 is engaged, because the 3225 decision is a decision that essentially the person must leave the UK and should be excluded from the UK, and is analogous and functionally equivalent to a deportation decision for that reason. The second point I want to make, uh, and this may be the crucial point in the case, concerns the, the, our response to the Secretary of State's arguments about Article 8. I, in my submission, my Lord Lord Justice Singh is absolutely right to say that Section 6 is the answer in these cases. And, and indeed, to the appellant's credit, that's a point that they've made clearly in their reply skeleton argument, which I hope my Lord's received and have, have, have had an opportunity to look at. The reason it's an answer is because in these cases, the appellants are saying, certainly Mr. Balajar Gary is saying, that the Secretary of State's particular decisions in issue engage Article 8 um, and are disproportionate in terms of Article 8 for various reasons, but principally because the justification for the decision doesn't exist on the um, appellant's position regarding the facts. Yes, in fact, pr proportionality is not really what we're talking about here. Well, it, of course it is technically, but I take my Lord's point as a shorthand if I can respect yes. say so, because proportionality, as Mr. Knapper explained in, in the RSAC case, yes. really turns as a threshold issue on this dispute of fact. If the Secretary of State is wrong to say there's dishonesty, she's wrong, there's just no justification Quite. for the decision. And so my client, is in, and indeed every migrant and every person in the United Kingdom, is entitled to hold the Secretary of State to the human rights um, entitlements that have been incorporated by the Human Rights Act on the basis that the Secretary of State is required to act compatibly with those rights pursuant to Section 6 of the Human Rights Act, and a judicial review can be pursued in the usual way on that basis. Now, the only way the Secretary of State <coughs> can overcome that argument 
is to say either that Section 6 has somehow been implied and repealed by the uh, provisions that were considered in the Shrestha case, which I'll come to, uh, which um, um, ha have been held to suggest or hold uh, or, pro or provide that the Secretary of State is entitled to insist on a formal application for leave to remain on human rights now for Africa to advance, or um, the Secretary of State would have to say that there's a sufficient basis for refusing uh, to entertain a claim for judicial review as a matter of the court's discretion um, on the basis that there's an adequate alternative remedy. Now, the first argument it is clearly um, hopeless, and indeed it hasn't been put in those terms. There can't be any suggestion that Section 6 of the HRA, a constitutional statute, has been impliedly repealed. And indeed, the same point can be... Uh, I mean, it's not just Section 50 of the 2006 legislation considered in Shrestha. It's also the provisions dealing with statutory appeals but there would have to be an argument that Section 6 has been implied and repealed in my submission. And that argument is simply uh, unsustainable. It hasn't been advanced in any event. Um, but the discretion argument is also misconceived um, as a matter of principle, because there are no appealable decisions in this case, nor is the Secretary of State able to say that a procedure is available which would give rise to an effective alternative to judicial review in these cases, uh, but not least because she's insisting, he's, forgive me, insisting on, on, on expensive applications being made which wouldn't immediately allow the applicants, the appellants, to respond to the decisions in question, um, but also because um, the suggestion that there is an adequate alternative remedy in this case because of the possibility of ex post facto human rights-based applications for leave to remain is inconsistent with RSAN, because my Lord, Lord Justice Underhill explained in RSAN at paragraphs 115 to 120 the circumstances in which an adequate alternative remedy will arise because of the possibility of an ex post facto human rights claim, and those requirements are not satisfied in the instant case, um, merely because there's the possibility of making an ex post facto uh, human rights-based application for leave to remain. So there is no answer to this this section six. Forgive me, but the, the, this may already have been covered, but this, this is, I think, potentially very important. Yes. So can I ask you this? Uh, there may be a third objection very to well. your argument, which, which you may need to address. And it's this, that however much you may submit, it's a matter of form rather than substance. What I think is said against you is that the decision that you have sought to JR <coughs> itself does not interfere with anyone's human rights at all. Uh, it is simply a refusal to give ILR. Now, it may be that because of that refusal, combined with the fact that an extant leave has expired, which in square brackets may not be true in every case, but let's assume it is true in a given case. Uh, nevertheless, even in such a case, what I think is said against you is that conceptually, that is still a, that is not the decision that is being challenged. The decision being challenged, in, in fact, doesn't interfere with anyone's human rights at all. Now, what does interfere with human rights in the future may be removal, in which case you can challenge the removal. Yeah. Or it may be in the interim period various statutory consequences which are called the hostile environment. I'm not sure, I and mean, it hasn't been put in this way so far, but one possibility would be that, that you try to get some kind of remedy against that, if necessary, a declaration of incompatibility, I suppose. But, but the point conceptually is made against you, and I think you do need to address it, that it's not the refusal of ILR which has interfered with any convention rights. Yes, well, can I deal with that in, in stages? I mean, firstly, I accept if, if the decisions that we challenge directly on the basis that they don't comply with the Section State by those decisions has acted incompatibly with Section 6, if those decisions don't engage us, then obviously the judicial reviews are not arguable and, and not good on the merits. Um, so I need to show, and I've sought to show in my submissions yesterday, that the decisions that we challenge engage Article 8. Now, to engage with my Lord Lord Justice Singh's um, point, um, I think the starting point has to be on what basis and for what reasons um, is it said that the decisions engage Article 8. We've given three specific reasons that are, in, in, that are, that are independent as to why the decisions engage Article 8. The first is that the decisions um, and the basis for them, viz. 3225, uh, constitute an implicit 
removal and exclusion decisions because of the very language and nature of paragraph 3225. And the related point, and I'm grateful to my Lord Lord Justice Underhill for putting it in this way to my learned friends for the Secretary of State in argument earlier, is that as a result of that decision, the um, appellants are, or at least Mr. Balajagari is, uh, liable to removal. So at least in Mr. Balajagari's case, the, 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 the functional and substantive effect of the Secretary of State's decision, particularly when you understand the basis of it, which is the conclusion that the person's very presence in the UK is undesirable, is to make them liable to removal. And logically, in those circumstances, if the Secretary of State is saying your presence in the UK is undesirable and you have no leave as a result of the decisions so that you're liable to removal, that's got to be a situation where the Secretary of State is, for, 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 for human rights, uh, for reasons that are relevant to the human rights analysis, saying essentially that the, sec that the, the, the relevant person, Mr. Balajagari, uh, has to leave the UK. Um, well, can we just pause there? It is said, well, if that is so, that will be so in every case in which a, except cases where someone's been here a very short time and can't run a plausible Article 8 case, in every case, uh, Article 8 will be engaged and someone will have a, uh, will be engaged by the mere refusal of permission, well, because that makes them liable to removal. Sure. Well, well, and uh, then there would be a human rights appeal in every such case at the moment of decision. Well, so, so to deal with the first part of that, it's wrong to say that, that the logic of the argument would mean that everyone who's refused an, an application and, and becomes an overstayer as, as a result, perhaps after the AR process or whatever, um, it necessarily has an interference with their Article 8 um, rights. That, that, that might be the position. But the reason why it's the position in this case is because of the 3325 decision. And that's why I've tied this reason for saying that Article 8 is engaged uh, into the language of 3225. Because here the Secretary of State is saying, you're very present in the UK is undesirable. And she's using this, forgive me, he's using that uh, decision to end leave. Um, well, I'm not sure the reason makes any difference. What how, the, the, the reputation point may be separate. Yeah, sure. but, but ignoring that, the interference, what you have to say, I think, is the interference with your Article 8 rights is being liable to removal. And whether that's because you're undesirable or merely because you don't satisfy some of the other requirements for being given leave to remain really doesn't matter. The fact is you are liable to removal. And that, assuming you've accumulated some Article 8 rights, is an interference with your Article 8 rights. Therefore, you can bring an Article 8 claim and they've got to justify it. Well, I think I mean I think I think isn't I isn't that right in principle. Well, I, I, certainly, if, if the mere liability to removal engages Article Eight, which I'll is what you have to say, isn't it? Th then, then that would be an independent reason in these cases for saying that Article Eight is engaged, or at least in, in Mr. Balajagari's case. I put the case slightly differently with respect, my lord. I say that three two two five, combined with a decision that has the effect of ending one's leave and therefore making one liable to removal, is an implicit removal decision because of the language of 3225 and the decision, because you can't say, if you're the Secretary of State, your very presence in the UK is undesirable, and then at the same time say, well, it's okay for you to stay here. It just doesn't make sense. The language of 3225 must be uh, consistent only with the view that someone should be removed and excluded. I'm sorry, but that, that, that doesn't follow logically, does it? Because of the remaining discretion, as you described this in, in, in the stages, the remaining discretion after the decision uh, that an individual, an individual's presence in the UK is undesirable. There's still a residual um, discretion. Yes. Uh, not uh, still yeah. a residual discretion under three two two five. Yeah. Well, with respect, I, I would submit that that c is consistent with my analysis because what's the point of that discretion if three two two five doesn't have the sorts of consequences I say it has? I mean, if if the Secretary of State, so in other words, the Secretary of State may choose not to use three two two five because. Um, the effect of doing that is essentially to, to state to the world that this person has to go. So the Secretary of State may think, well, well this sorry, person... The, the, the result is in this case is that uh, you, you can't stay here forever. I put that yes. in, in, in that long way. But if you yes. get ILR, that's the result in this case. Um, you might be on your well, that, that, yeah, that's right, my Lord. That's the result given the particular requirements for ILR in this case. Now, if we were dealing with a 10-year... Uh, uh, lawful residence application, there is a good character requirement built into 
that provision. And so the Secretary of State could say, well, actually, we're not saying that you should leave the UK on the basis that your presence is undesirable. We're just not satisfied that you're a good character. Um, and that's why my first point in, in reply was to emphasise the nature uh, and language of paragraph 325. Um, but to come back to my Lord Lord Justice Underhill's uh, uh, point, because there's a second way to respond to it in my submission, um, the reality is that under the statutory scheme, the substance of the decision that's been taken, at least in Mr. Balajagari's case, is to say that you've got to leave the UK. That's what the decision letter says. That's consistent with the only rational way to approach the language of 3225 and the use of it in this case. And that's how the statutory scheme operates, because there's no further step required for the Secretary of State to, in the future, make a but, separate but ev decision. Every letter refusing an application for either an extension of existing leave to remain or ILR yes. um, will have that form at the end saying yes. you are liable to removal. Well, let, let's take I'm, a I'm sorry, I'm sorry, but the, 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 what the letters say is not, not that you've got to go. What the letters say is if you do not have leave, you've got to go. That is what the letter says, my Lord. But, of course, in Mr. Ballager Gary's case, the effect of the decision was that he didn't have leave. So when you bear that in mind and look at the language oh, yeah. of the letter, Secretary of State saying go, but crucially, she's also, he's also saying your very presence in the UK is undesirable. And he can't say that in the, at the same time rationally, say, well, you're allowed to stay indefinitely or whatever. Now, it, let's take a hypothetical example. Let's use a, a, a tier four student who's applied for um, le further leave to remain. His application is refused and he's rendered no there as a direct result of that decision. He's then liable to remove him. But the immigration rules allow him a window of opportunity to make a further application. Um, and going back to the Pat and Islam case that um, um, my Lord Lord Justice seems particularly familiar with, um, that's an example of a situation where, um, in, in relation to Mr. Islam in that case, there was a possibility of making a new application within a 14-day, sorry, a 28-day window of time. The time is now 14 days. So the Secretary of State acknowledges you can make a new application as an overstay, albeit that you've only got a limited window of time. But the difference between that hypothetical and the instant case is, is that 325 has not been used. I mean, the crucial thing here is that the Secretary of State is saying your very presence in the UK is undesirable. Well, OK, but we have that. Um, and of course, if I'm wrong about that, and the way it operates um, as an implicit removal decision and um, exposing someone to liability of removal in this particular context, there are two independent reasons why Article 8 yeah. is engaged. The second one, in terms of the, the consequences for the migrant, um, by reference to the so-called hostile environment, has not been explained away at all by the Secretary of State's submissions. And I took you to case law yesterday um, that demonstrated clearly, and again, there's been no answer to that case law by the Secretary of State, um, that these sorts of decisions would engage Article 8 um, because they'd expose one uh, to a migrant to consequences which are clearly of such gravity um, as to engage Article 8. And as I pointed out to my Lord Lord Justice Singh yesterday, it's no answer to say, well, those decisions didn't concern migrants because these are cases where, but for the allegation of dishonesty and undesirability, the migrant would be entitled to indefinite leave to remain. Um, and they're cases where these are migrants who have been allowed to work and develop careers and pursue self-employed activity up until the point of the application. And the only reason why they're not able to do that um, going forward is because of a hotly contested allegation of dishonesty um, and undesirability, which we say uh, must be challenged by way of a fact-finding process if the decision in question engages Article 8. And similarly, the Secretary of State put forward no uh, response to the argument that Article 8 is engaged because of the use of 3225, which um, necessarily <coughs> um, engages Article 8's uh, aspect in terms of protecting reputation and as an aspect of private life. Um, and um, when looking at that uh, reason for why Article 8 is engaged in these cases, the, the crucial thing is simply the use of 3225. So the Secretary of State could take decisions to refuse an application. Let's say um, uh, uh, the, the points-based requirements are simply not met and the, the fact that they weren't met has no bearing at all on one's character. That could expose one to the hostile environment and all the rest of it, make one liable to remove it. But that's irrelevant for the purposes of this third independent reason why Article 8 is engaged. It's only where the Secretary of State is saying that you're dishonest and that you're undesirable that um, the decision engages this aspect, uh, the art Article 8 aspect um, it, uh, in terms of the protection of reputation. Um, and I, I just need to show that one of those three ways of looking at the case is right. We submit that they're all right. Um, but if, if my lords are, are, are with me, that the second or third, or and the third of those is right, 
and then perhaps you can draw, avoid the thorny issue or, or, or what might be thought of as a thorny issue um, that my learned friend Mr. Marrick has raised of the, of the scope of your decision. And so, my lords, um, I'd ask you to bear that in mind. Unless you have any further questions on that particular point that my lord, Lord Justice Singh, put to me, and that's my response, if you like, on the substantive issue, which uh, I engage with. Um, and obviously, I, I dealt with that at some length yesterday. Um, can I turn thirdly to procedural? Uh, sorry, can I turn um, uh, next to the Patel decision dealing with arms plays? Um, that's at tab 26. Can I ask my lord just to very quickly turn that up? Entirety of paragraphs 26 to uh, 29 in pages 661 to 663. Um, at, but for uh, immediate purposes, can I ask my laws just to, to skirt, uh, skim down paragraph 28? So this is the judgment of Lord Carnworth for the, uh, with which the other members of the court agreed. And you can see from these passages that the argument that was advanced was, a, was based on the so-called Padfield principle, that there was an implied duty under the statutory scheme um, on the Secretary of State to make an immediate removal decision because of the one-stop policy of the scheme. That's a completely different issue from that which presents itself to this court. And we submit, therefore, that Patel and Murdoch is of no assistance, uh, and indeed the Dane Murdoch line of cases leading to Patel and Murdoch is of no assistance. Um, thirdly and finally on, on, on the Article 8, our response to the Article 8, um, can I ask my Lord just to turn up the Shrestha case at Tab 38 very briefly? That's volume two of the authorities. So what the court held in, in Shrestha uh, was that the Secretary of State could insist on formal paid-for application to be made, although it was accepted, see paragraph 33, that removal couldn't be effected without considering a human rights response to a Section 120 notice. The case is of no relevance in my submission to the instant appeals, because in the instant appeals, the appellants have challenged the decisions directly on the basis that they interfere with their Article 8 rights. And as I've indicated earlier, Section, section 6 allows them to do, of the Human Rights Act allows them to do that. And the Secretary of State has not put forward any uh, coherent basis as to why the court shouldn't apply Section 6 in these cases. Uh, my Lord's turning penultimately to procedural fairness deal with the suggested concession that I made. Uh, I don't think I made a concession. I, I certainly indicated, and I stand by this to my Lord Lord Justice Underhill, that if there was a full fact-finding uh, process involved in the administrative review process, and that would be a more difficult case in terms of procedural fairness for me to meet in terms of challenging the initial decision, but I certainly endorse my Lord Lord Justice Singh's observations that the, the classic requirements of ex parte DD fairness are that a, a, a person is given an opportunity, notice, and an opportunity to respond to an allegation before a decision is taken. And given the nature and consequences of the allegation in this case, in my submission, there is no reason not to take a strict approach 
can apply that requirement in the instant case. Uh, indeed, doing so would afford the court an opportunity to provide a practical process that will allow for the human rights concerns in question in this, these appeals to be dealt with, because if the Secretary of State puts the appellant, an appellant or applicant on notice of an allegation of undesirability, that the Secretary of State could also then, and would have to, we say, in terms of, to meet the requirements of procedural fairness, uh, invite the applicant to respond to, the, to all of the issues that are relevant to a 3225 decision. So that's not just just the allegation of dishonesty, it's also the overall assessment that there's undesirability, which will allow the migrant to put forward countervailing evidence. So even if it's admitted that there's dishonesty, as I explained yesterday, that's no, by no means the end of the matter. And it would also allow for the discretionary aspect of paragraph 325 to be engaged with by the migrant. So, for example, the migrant could say, I've got five children who are at, at a critical stage in their education in the UK, so please don't use 3225 in your discretion, Secretary of State. And I do uh, respectfully endorse the approach of Ms Mountfield QC in, um, the Fosk uh, in Mr Justice Foskett's judgment in the NQ case that we looked at yesterday, uh, where, where she, she argued, as I understand it, that at the stage of considering discretion in terms of the 3225 decision making, the Secretary of State should be allied to any Article 8 considerations that were raised. And I think my learned friend Ms Anderson would accept that in principle, now, just on that, I would accept that in the, mine, the majority of cases, it may be that going through that articulated an analysis won't um, cause the Secretary of State much difficulty because the Secretary of State may not have very much to go on at that stage. But if uh, the procedural fairness demands that we say apply here are honoured by the Secretary of State, um, he might be provided with enough material to make a proper informed articulated assessment. And if there's then a decision on that human rights claim made in response to a minded to letter, that could itself be appealable. Um, within the tribunal system. And so that might be one mechanism of protecting the relevant interests here in a practical way in circumstances where, and I say this with great, great respect, inexplicably the Secretary of State has declined to offer a sensible process um, which will allow for Article 8 concerns to be properly protected, contrary to the approach that was taken in Arsan and, and Ash Ashif Khan. Now finally, um, my Lords, so I just want to emphasise this. We submit that one of the key problems with Mr Justice Spencer's uh, approach in the Khan case is that he failed to appreciate that undesirability is a separate and vital aspect of 3225 decision making in these cases. So that it's not enough simply to say that there is dishonesty and that that was um, concluded on a Wednesday reasonable basis by the Secretary of State. Uh, it's necessary for the Secretary of State to show through adequate reason in applying um, the heightened scrutiny standard of Wednesday we say is applicable that there's been a proper assessment of the undesirability question. Uh, and that allows for um, the Secretary of State to acknowledge that there will be an infinite, infinite variety of circumstances in reality, ranging from a very uh, old example of dishonesty that's been admitted, um, but explained on the basis of particular circumstances where the relevant person has then reformed and has uh, generated a lot of positive contributions, say, to the uh, culture and society of the United Kingdom subsequently, to cases where there's been massive, deliberate evasion of tax. The Secretary of State must um, um, uh, engage separately with that undesirability aspect of 3225, and any guidance this court might want to give, in my submission, should bear that firmly in mind. And unfortunately, Mr Justice Martin Spencer's judgment in Khan is defective because it, fail it, it completely overlooks that requirement. My laws, unless you have any questions, I've done my best to cover a lot of territory in little time, no, um, uh, but, but uh, I propose uh, to end there. Been, Well, uh, you finished at 4.30 on the dot, I am told. Uh, uh, now, as I say, the other council have the uh, right to reply on general matters. In fact, Mr. Saini, although you did address us on some general matters, uh, they were peculiar to the Tameside point, and all that Mr. Malik has done is adopt his skeleton. So I don't really see that there's any substantive right to reply as opposed to a formal one. Just a I won't take more than, I would have thought, seven or eight minutes at the most, I hope. It's mainly well, it depends on what you want to cover. Point. Seven or eight minutes, if, there, if you're not going to say anything you're allowed to say, is too long. What, what, what's the matters you want well, to cover? It's in relation to 
the same side point, but also to the extent that you have heard from Mr. Mike regarding the content of the refusal letter, just the structure really and the idea. Just one moment. Uh, I don't, we don't need to hear from you. We don't, it's not that we don't need to hear from you. You have no right to reply on Tameside because no new submissions were made. Uh, very well, my lord. Um, my lord, just one point then in, in that, um, if I may say, Mr. Malik has cleverly um, used my client's case as an example of the overstaying principle against the human rights element. You will notice that from my skeleton argument, it's the subject of the other appellant. I didn't put that at the forefront of my submissions. My submissions have always been about tax, hence the uh, discussion of Ivy and the other tax authorities. Yes. But there is one matter which might interest the court in that I haven't weighed in on the human rights arguments at all. But just for the sake of completeness, given uh, what was said yesterday by my learned friend regarding syllabus and what, Mr. what Lord Justice Singh was saying regarding um, the engagement and uh, interference in terms of our claim, it may be. regarding the positive and negative interference and the obligations of member states. In short, the point being that in Jeunesse there was an unlawful migrant there, and it was the positive obligation on terms of the member state to not interfere with her life. But there is something said in terms of those paragraphs comparatively where there are settled status migrants, of course not nationals, and even those uh, migrants with that temporary status do have uh, can, of course, have interference with their rights. Well, that's trite law. We don't need the journalist well, to tell us that. Respectfully, well, no one's covered this point, but it is... Well, it's because it doesn't need covering. It's so obvious, isn't it? If you're saying that an unsettled migrant nevertheless has Article 8 rights, um, the reason it hasn't been addressed is that nobody has challenged that. And well, it's simply the point that there is a, uh, a negative obligation not to interfere with that established life, which would be more established than not, say, comparatively in the case of an unsettled migrant, such as Miss Jeunesse, compared well. to a settled migrant. It, it's important. Okay, well, we have the point. Thank you. Uh, yes, now, Mr. Kareem and Mr. Slatter, you... Uh, <coughs> again, if there's actually anything you want to add to uh, what Mr. Biggs said on the points of substance, you're, strictly speaking, entitled to do so, but we... I should be surprised if you feel the need. Uh, Mr. Malik did refer to each of your cases, I think, briefly by way of illustration of general points, and certainly anything particular you wanted to say about those, uh, you can, but I'm not encouraging you. Well, my lord, um, very briefly, in respect of Mr. Majumda's case, I know my learned friend Mr. Malik very briefly took he did. some of the facts. No, he did. Um, and of course, um, he flagged up the fact that the basis of the refusals are there was a discrepancy, but of course, that what I say quite simply is that if there was a late tax submission, there's nothing to compare that against, and it's unclear where the discrepancy uh, is. And I quite understand the point, Mr. Perhaps Green. just by one example, it's a really meant to example, my lord, but if your lordship was asking for my name and I stood up and said I'm Mr. Biggs, that would be a positive assertion which is incorrect, inaccurate, and potentially dishonest. If, however, I returned tomorrow and I said I'm Mr. Kareem, I've been late in my response, but accurate in my response, as it were. And that's precisely what happens in Mr. Majumda's case. And there is no discrepancy. And I think I understood your point even without that example. <laughs> <laughs> I have nothing else to use to do. I don't think for this point, unless you're particularly keen to edit <coughs> the camera, we need to insist on your choice. <coughs> Anything you need to say? I'm greatly, yes. Just uh, Mr. Malik, I think you're going to accept was, was wrong factually in my case, and that the IRL decision was sent after um, my leave expired. It was not the decision, although dated the 3rd of, of, of February, was not sent until the 11th of February. That's page 857 of the final call. Um, <clears throat> and uh, what, what, what the, the, um, uh, the, my, my Lord uh, Justice um, <coughs> uh, asked for an example of a, a removal window, and it, it is actually. In uh, page 606, <coughs> oh, the receipt of the administrative review decision um, gave seven days. Fine, we need to look at it, but it, 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 if we want to see an example, it's one at 606. Thank you. Uh, and just the last, very last yes. point, my, my Lord, just on a technical matter in terms of the scheme, 
obviously during the administrative review process, um, while the leave continues, you can't make a, a, an application to vary your leave during that time as a result of AR 2.10 subparagraph B, which is on page 250. Um, um, because the effect of that is your leave ends the day prior to the date on which the fresh application is submitted. Yes, thank you. Thank you very much. Well, uh, as I've already said, and this, of course, is inevitable in a case of this sort, we'll be reserving our uh, decision. Uh, as I have said, uh, if uh, we uh, need to, we will ask for further submissions on the uh, individual cases from the uh, Secretary of State who hasn't replied except in the rather tangential way that Mr. Malik has on those cases, uh, and we would give, obviously, then a right of reply also in writing to the individuals uh, uh, in question. The uh, subject to that, we will simply follow the normal uh, procedure. Once we're ready with our judgment, uh, we will uh, circulate it to the parties in the usual way. Uh, for correction of typographical and other minor errors uh, and uh, will invite uh, submissions on uh, consequential matters uh, which will be dealt with on the basis of written submissions uh, and uh, there, will be, there will then be a final hand down hearing which no one need attend. Uh, we're grateful to everyone um, who has addressed us and those behind who contributed to their uh, efforts. Uh, thank you very much. I forgot to deal with this before because of the limited time. There is actually technically an outstanding application to reduce new evidence in my appeal. It's not been engaged with by my. Well, just sit, everyone sit down for a moment. I thought we, we did allude to it, and you said the only thing in it that was important was the. Uh, did, did I not remember this? Was that it, it, it was the formal basis on which the. Um, Review was said to be before us, though in fact it was before us in the bundle anyway. No, 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 have, I mis it, have I misremembered? I'm afraid you have, Greg. Yeah, no, no, so, it so could a, happen. There's a witness statement from Mr. Badger Gary. The reason we put that in um, is to show what he would say in the substantive hearing if we were right that he's entitled to that as a matter of article. Well, I think this comes into the category of points relating to individual cases, right. which, if necessary, uh, we'll have to deal with separately. Before you rise as well, you, you asked my lord that uh, the email confirming the reconsideration evidence be handed up. I, I do have those. I had given them to my learned friend, but I forgot to do so at the beginning of the day. Apologies. Thank you. Uh, well, uh, yes, uh, you better do that now. Thank I'll you. give it to you as well. Pass it to you. Well, uh, no, give it to us now. That's very and if, well. If, if I'm afraid debating essay isn't isn't good well, enough. If you say you're content, that's fine. I'm grateful. Debating essay doesn't. Re we well, almost certainly do that anyway, so that doesn't. Um, well, my Latin probably inappropriate. No, you, all right. If you, all I'm trying to convey is that when you're doing that process of thinking what to do, I've certainly got no objection to considering the witness statement and seeing whether that is a source of something that you'd want to. That's um, very helpful, Ms. Anderson. Thank you. I'm very clear. All right. All rise. Thank you.